Welcome to People Talking Sitting Down. What makes a good judge? Um, what makes a good judge is temperament and respect. There's a certain point where fairness and justice have to be the main goal to the judicial system. But does the entire system lean one way or the other? I think it's very polarized, and especially because of politics in this country these days. Both sides say, you have to respect our opinion, but they don't respect the other side's opinion. So it's difficult as a judge because somebody always has to lose. Is that your emotional support paddle? It's me who's, who's ass I'm going to kick next paddle. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, that's a good way to start. Well, Scott, thank you so much for, for joining. Um, one of the reasons, like, uh, when I met you, I knew there was something that was, like, different, obviously. I'm sure you've heard You mean that. off? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You mean Re touch? Respectfully. Respect, touched. <laughs> respectfully. Um, but with people like that, there's always more to it. You know, there's always, like, when, when somebody's running around, like, I saw you running around downstairs at the cheesesteak shop. Um I knew something was up. And then once I saw about like the article and your background, it's like, oh, there's so much more going on here. Um, so I think I want to start with, with what you do full time and what you've done in your career. And we'll get to the cheesesteaks after that. No problem. Uh, um, but how'd you get into law? Why'd you get into law? Like what, what, what can you explain? I know nothing about the judicial system. And I was telling, actually, we have a mutual friend. I forgot to mention my buddy, Rich, Rich Jacajian. It's a good man. Yeah. <laughs> is in my uh, courtroom all the time, and uh, he's come to the cheesesteak spot too. Jason's a good man. Yeah. So he, and when he came to my courtroom this week, and uh, he had identified himself for the record, uh, I asked him what grade he was in before he learned to spell his name. I said, "Was he in high school or middle school?" He, he's a good guy. Yeah. He good is, DA too. Good prosecutor. He said the same. He said the same thing about you. He, I texted him last night, um, and I was like, w "Would you know the name Scott DeClaudio?" And he's like, "Dude, great guy, great judge." Um, and when he said that, my first question was like, what, what makes a good judge? Well, I'll start with that. Um, what makes a good judge is temperament and respect. Um, what I mean by that is you have litigants in your courtroom, whether it's civil or criminal, I've only do criminal. Um, you have to pay respect to the system, respect to the defendants, respect to the victims, especially, uh, respect to each of their families, respect to the, the judiciary and, um, the appearances that, you know, we convey. So I think the first and foremost thing is you convey respect to everyone and the reason we're there. And by doing that, you show up on time. And I've been on the bench nine years and I on the bench at nine o'clock promptly every single day. Um, I like to think that I have some compassion, but I'm not a raging liberal either. There's a certain point where fairness and justice have to be the main goal to the judicial system. Um, so is there, yeah, you want to stay as center as possible is, does the entire, I don't want to say industry, um, but does the entire system lean one way or the other? I think it's very polarized, um, especially because of politics in this country these days. Um, I'm a moderate. I got to be honest. I'll vote for a Republican. I'll vote for a Democrat. Um, I do not affiliate. I'm a Democrat registered, but, mm -hmm. um, I like to think I'm a moderate and do what makes sense for both me, my family and people in the city and my electorate. Um, but it seems to be so polarized this point in life, doesn't it? It's either yeah, you, right. you either are liberal or conservative and everybody's wrong. Um, both sides say you have to respect our opinion, but they don't respect the other side's opinion. So it's difficult as a judge because somebody always has to lose. There has to be a winning side in a criminal case. It's either guilty or not guilty. Um, generally speaking, whatever sentence I give, somebody wants more, somebody wants less. Um, to be a moderate, to be fair and just, you have to be able to be well-reasoned. And I pride myself most respectfully in explaining why I got to whatever decision or whatever sentence I impose, how I got there, what factors led into it. Any single thing I've done, I'll be honest, I explain what the considerations are, what facts I find, and how I got to where I'm going to be. And I found a great deal of respect has been given to me because of the respect to the system people I give. Yeah, I, 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 I've never thought about it as uh, people winning and losing. Um, and, and the fact that that, because one of the things I wanted to unwind with you specifically was like the emotional toll that this would take on a person to be in this situation. Like I talk about it all the time, having these conversations, talking about, you know, people's traumatic past. Like it, it when, you know, Max leaves and you leave, like it kind of hits me sometimes afterwards. And like you go home and 
you just go make dinner after a full day of like, you know, seeing what you see, hearing what you hear. How do you deal with that? It's not for everybody. It's not even for all my colleagues. Um, I think it's a little easier for me because I've been doing it about 35 years. I was a prosecutor for four years, a defense attorney for like 24 and my ninth year on the bench. So I've kind of seen it all. You don't want to be dispassionate. You want to be compassionate. But to analyze anything, you have to take passion out of it. You have to take um, emotion out of it. You have to be able to analytically find rational thought within the facts and within your decisions. For me, um, as I told you when we began this podcast, I'm a little touched. Yes. <laughs> I have a mathematical brain. I observe, I logically come to conclusions. So it's more like a challenge to me to get it right. Um, whatever that is, either the finding of guilt or innocence or not guilty, whether it's sending someone to state prison or giving them probation or anywhere in between, it's what makes the most sense factoring in absolutely everything I know, both from my experience my experience as a judge, my experience as a human being, and what I like to think is, you ready for this? Superior intelligence. Um, you factor everything in, you get to a lot of right decisions, and you have to care. I think caring is probably the most important factor, and I care. I gave up a very lucrative career, actually two careers, to do this. Um, money isn't everything, happiness is. Yeah. And I gave up financial well-being. Like, I'm still, you know, Okay, yeah, but I gave up three, four times my salary. What to, could have been? To, no, to what was for twenty five years. Yeah, <laughs> not what could have been. What I gave up, like gave up the cars and the houses to make the world a better place because I realized that every case I do affects not only the defender or the victim, but their families, their friends, their children, their grandchildren, their grandmother, uh, society at large. If I let someone out and give them too easy a sentence and they go rob or rape or murder somebody else. So it's an extremely hard balance, but mathematically, I think I get the right decision 99.9% .9 of the time. So is there something like, why do you, and this is a dumb question, but like, why do you care? What, what is it that, what is it that your experience led you? My parents. Tell me about Shay them. and Jimmy. Um, we'll go back to my upbringing in South Philly. Grew up lower middle class. Mom and dad were salt to the earth. <laughs> um, dad helped everybody. If somebody had a flat tire, I remember pulling over and having him help fix the flat. My mom was sweet and kind and made dinners every Monday for my family and friends. Uh, we owned a corner store called Shays in South Philly. Somebody couldn't pay or somebody couldn't look sad because they couldn't play a video game. We put a quarter in for them. I was born and raised to be kind to others and compassionate. And growing up in South Philly, with the sense of community, owning the corner store yeah. in South Philly that had the video games and the ice cream and the cheesesteaks and the cigarettes and the Sunday paper. I think it just shaped me in a way that I care. How different was that? Like how disc like that's what we talk about in here. And um and respectfully, you like we've had we've had a lot of younger people in here. Like you just grew up in a different world that we did. Just straight up a different world. I, I went for a walk the other day and like we, we talked right right before. Yeah. And I've been doing this thing where I'm trying to go for a walk in the morning without my phone or headphones. After your, after your meditation. Yeah, after meditation, like just, just being in a clear mindset. And what I've realized, just doing it for the past two weeks, like everyone's on their phone. 95% of people, and if they're not looking at their phone, they've got headphones in. So like we're all in the separate world where you grew up in a world where you went to the corner store in the morning, you said hi over coffee, you talked to people. You stayed on the corner after coffee and talked like we did yeah. for 15 minutes before you went on your walk. <laughs> you sit there and talk, how's life? What, I think we talked, I remember that you meditated in the morning, I know why you're going on a walk, both for health and mental health, to just get out of the concept of being on your phone and sitting in your apartment. Um, I actually fear for your generation. Um, I had the greatest life. I tell people all the time I didn't get cheated. Don't be sad. I hope to live another couple decades, uh, maybe even three, but I didn't get cheated. I had, I have a great life. My daughter, if you ever see her in the store, she's one and a half. She waves at everybody. <laughs> she sees me and my wife communicating with people. And one of the greatest joys of Shays is I'm being able to, to do that again. We have that map up of everybody in the world coming over. Just 10 minutes. What are you doing here? Where are you going? You should see the Liberty Bell. Make sure you go to behind the art museum. Don't go north. Go towards the Rittenhouse Square. Those 10 minutes, the smiles, people texting me from all over the world. I've <laughs> never been happier the last two months. Really? Being able to talk to people. I Even though I've always communicated, I find it difficult to communicate with people because everybody's on their phones. 
um, especially with COVID, we've touched on that. We got further insulated. Everybody's been on their phones. I bet everybody's on their phones two, three hours a day, just looking at Facebook and Instagram and the news and nonsense instead of calling grandma, I'm texting grandma, I'm seeing other friends doing, I know you had a tough day. My daughter, I talked to her, she's 25, my eldest. We talk once every two weeks. We text. What's wrong with picking up the phone? I tell my wife, call your sister. She texts. I'm like, I didn't say text your sister. Call your sister. Hear her voice. Ask her. You can hear in someone's voice how they're doing. Do we have to go over there? So I fear for your generation, you're becoming way too detached, too de dependent on isolation. And we spoke about this, and I'll let you shoot back to you. Most people are on the phone. I think you said more than this. I said two hours a day. Oh my God. You yeah. said four or five. Oh my God. And that, no, double, like eight. Eight is the so, standard, so I think. If, so if you sleep eight hours and you're awake 16, you're on your phone half of your life. Eight out of 16 hours. Who wants to be on their phone looking at Facebook and Instagram about cats? half their lives you're missing out take a walk say hello F talk to someone who's interesting see look up at the sky and see the gargoyles in city hall see the yeah. masonic Capital. <laughs> like just observe and enjoy maybe you'd stay on instagram or facebook or tiktok for an hour which spurs an idea like we should go to the barns that looks fun we should you know hey that cat looks like fun maybe i'll buy one but to do it every day each day hours a day is foolish and this message, this isn't why we're here, but people get off your effing phones and live your life. Don't live other people's lives. Don't, this isn't, you're watching TV. We give my daughter a half hour of TV time. You guys are doing eight hours of TV time. Uh, you're working eight hours, you're sleeping eight hours, you're on your phone four. What are you doing? 160 of your life doing anything worth anything that's enjoyable or, pro, or proactive or fun? I don't know. It's, Do it's, I sound crazy? No, Somebody tell me. No, you're, you're right on point. And, and Am I crazy on point or really on point? You're really or you on tell point. me I'm on point because I'm a judge. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm telling you on point because there's like three different things as you were talking that I was thinking about. That one thing, again, from that short conversation that we had, I remembered something that you said that had an impact on my walks every single time I went out on a walk. Because you said to me, if you do that for the rest of your life, you're going to be all right. And I've had the best two weeks I've had in a long time because I've, I've been in this routine. I told you about, I was trying to get up earlier in the morning. It's, you know, helping me out with work and being able to like do this on the side, like all of it. It's finally coming together because I've been able to have this routine and, and just get off the technology, get into the world. And when I went on a walk, I'd go up the art museum steps and I looked at the top of the art museum steps. I don't even know what those animals are, but the craftsmanship of that. I was like, but like you don't see that when you go around the back of the art museum one day. It's it, amazing. Yeah. Um, thank you for that, by the way, and I, I hope you continue to do it. Um, my ex girlfriend, who's equally or more touched, used to say, <laughs> "An object in motion stays in motion; not the rest stays at rest." If you sit in your couch, how many times have we sat on our couch and got on Instagram? And next thing you know, we're kind of watching TV. We're on Instagram. And it's two hours later, and you haven't even moved. It happened. Yeah, physically, it's horrible for you. Um, you feel better when your endorphins are active and you're walking. You feel better about yourself. You say hello to people. You see people. Like, it's just a better life. Get off the couch. Force yourself to take a 20-minute walk uh, in a different direction every day. Smile at somebody. Wave at someone. Um, don't be on your phone while you're walking. Get your thoughts together. What am I going to do better at work? What can I do better socially? Should I start dating? Is my girlfriend great for me? <laughs> um, like, just think about your life instead of accepting the status quo. It's so funny you say that because I had after, so I, I got a new manager at work. I uh, set up my schedule and we had a meeting about it. And we went over the schedule and he, and he, he laughed. He, he's like, you know, we hired you to, to work. There's a, there's a lot of time on the schedule that's not work-related stuff. And I said, like, you know, I have to, I have to go for my walk. I have to meditate. You I have more to journal productive. because I, so that because yes, I could just take Adderall and like lock in and have it, you know, be a drug induced focus, which is great and works for people. I it's can't, not great. I can't do it. There's nothing about that that's great <laughs> about being drug induced focus. Yes. You have to force yourself through. I mean, I think for the general, yes, for the general population, no. Unless you I have just, to. Don't I just, get me wrong. Yeah, like I just do know one or two people that. It works for them, and it's the reason that they're able to do. Are they going to do that things. for the next forty years? They might, and it's something that like I can't. Tell them to go on walks with you. They'll get the energy from the walk, and yeah. they'll come back and be focused. But that's the thing. It's like there's, there's. I, I said that. I said 
now I can turn my phone off and just spend two, because I can get more out of two hours straight and get into a flow state and be more productive and get eight more, th- you know, eight times more done than I can if I'm checking my phone 15 times throughout the hour, because my my thought process is interrupted every single time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this out to your listeners or people who listen to the podcast. Isn't there a sense of relief when your phone battery dies? And it takes like 15 minutes for it to charge. You're like, you know what? It's not going to be so bad. Yeah. I don't have to, you know, yeah. I can actually get be productive. So here's my whole thing that what I'm trying to do, especially with this is like, we need to start talking about these things in the way that they are in reality. The fact is, is that we're already steps into this transhumanist mute movement. Cause as transhumanist, what does that mean? When we, become one with technology in one way or the other. And we already are. Is that really a word or did you make it up? No, no, it's a word. It's transhumanist. <laughs> transhumanist. Is that one word so or like two words? One. One word. But so like, you know, that's like what Elon Musk doing, putting chips in people's brains and stuff for like, again, transhumanist. for paraplegals and, you know, yep. it's for good reasons right now, it can get hijacked. But my example that I always use is like when you close your apps on your phone, just like you're talking about the Sometimes there's battery. like 27. Yeah. You're like, Jesus, Christmas, how was I on 27 but So apps? Isn't, isn't it a little like anxiety relieving when you close them? Well, I don't have that many, thankfully. Yeah. But yes, <laughs> when I close, know what? It makes me feel good when I close my wife's apps. Yeah. Like I borrow her phone to talk to her mom and I see him and I swipe as quick yeah. as I can and then I say, But so we're already integrated with this technology in one way or the other. Again, like we, we're angered by TV all the time. We're angered by these things. Like these, you know, we're already impacted heavily. And also like, Part of what I was thinking as you were saying that it's like all of this is just your subconscious being hijacked by different things, which I'm sure you see in the courtroom. Do you know what I challenge the, everybody the to do as they listen to this? So everybody likes to do two things at once. Yeah. Go on your Apple phone, which about say you got a couple thousand listeners, say um fifteen hundred of them will have um their Apple phone. Look at how long you were on your phone yesterday. If it's more than two hours, turn it off for an hour and think about that's what you want for your life. Everybody looks at, I mean, I see people at seven, eight hours, as you said, like, yeah. what, and then tells you, if you look, I, you spent an hour and a half on Instagram, an hour on Facebook, two hours researching the news. Again, two hours. I'm not a big cat guy. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm a dog guy. Like two hours looking at cats, like pulling at balls. Like, is that the way you want to live your life? And, and, and everybody knows consciously, like, no, we don't want to be doing that, but we're not being conscious is the thing. We're, we're acting in this again, just like adver- lazy. Yes. And we're not thinking and at, like, just like advertisements, like the more times you see something, the more times you're going to click it. And well, I why, see it on the back end. With why YouTube do you think stuff. Spotify and TikTok are all free? They're free the because it, everybody's watching them. They don't even have to charge because you're so transfixed. They put ads in front of you without even realizing you're watching them. Yeah. And they don't even have to charge for their great services do like you, music and videos because they have transfixed, transfixed us into this being a trans, trans, transhumanist. Tran, they've transfixed us into being a transhumanist. That's a good, that's a good Say that know, three times fast. Do you, do you know anything about the, I, I don't know, some case, and I don't know why I would assume that you just know every law, you know, ever, but I guess you should, right? Do no. you know every law? No, not close. <laughs> I've never done a civil case in my life or a real estate case, but you talk in the criminal realm. I know every case that ever existed. Okay, okay. Because I remember, because there was something like back in like, I don't know, it was like 1950s or 60s when movies started coming I was, out. I'm old, but not, not that old, but. <laughs> but there was a case where like these production companies were putting in advertisements in like, because like you can only consciously see. Subliminal. Yes, yeah. You can only see so many I know frames or whatever. It, where they would flip it. Um, so fast that you didn't realize you were seeing it and subconsciously. Yeah. And then like everyone goes and gets Skittles because they saw Skittles a hundred times. I, I actually, I never actually saw if that was real. I know they believed it was real because they did it. So there must've been some study, but I've never really yeah. followed up to see if you subliminally, so I think that's yeah. the word too, like yeah, yeah. transhumanist, um, <laughs> do something. I mean, that's why they have Coke products placed in a movie. Coke pays for you to, for the star to be drinking yeah. the Coke. You see it enough, you'll go buy a Coke. But that's the thing. And that's another thing we don't, which is where I get uncomfortable. Like, we don't talk about these things. We are being manipulated at all times. Like, you, you look Did at, I finish your sentence? I mean, yes. Like, that's, uh, I was thinking about the Phillies and all baseball, you know, that they've got the patches now. And then there's advertisements on the back of the mound, the Nissan call to the bullpen. It's like everything, like, we're being pelted. Yep, well, with this at all times. That's and again, a whole nother conversation. We, do we really need to pay you a million dollars every time you pitch a game? How about we leave that out and pay you a half a million dollars to pitch a game? But why would we do that? Why? Because so that the owners can make more money? Well, how about so the owners th- don't do that and they don't 
And then who gets the money? Nobody. We don't put the advertisements on the back of the mail. But that's the thing. That's what I'm... Again, I think that we don't have this conversation straight enough. Isn't that the way that our system is built? Like, isn't that the way... Like, more capitalist society, more money. I'm in sales. More money. We well, all I, want more so things. We'll, it, it will even out. But what happens yeah. is if they put too many products, we'll stop watching. And then if we stop watching, it become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Less people want to advertise because less eyes are on it. So there's only so many patches... You can put on a jersey before the average viewer gets sick. I'm like, I'm not watching this. This is just yeah. too commercialized. And then when there's less viewers, there's less people buying the patches. Yeah. So it's it's a supply demand argument. And and, and, and I think, we're not at the we're not there yet. And I Sad, think, I'm there, but you yeah. might not be. Baseball is baseball is going to see it because um, I don't I mean I don't watch sports as much as I used to, but baseball is going to see it. Um, and with the gambling and everything, and I was uh, I'm big I like went through college big big gambler like enjoyed it thoroughly i actually wrote a paper on it like the the legalization of it before it started because it was obvious just like everything with marijuana gay marriage like it happens state by state they start slowly dripping. espn has their own sports books like while you're watching a game it gives you the odds in the corner yeah. of the screen it's a little much for me it takes it away from to, to me it takes away from the game oh i, I turn the channel i can't i mean i'm I'm not anti-gambling. I won't get in my past. I happen to be a professional poker player, by the way. Really? Um, my dad, <laughs> when we get back to Shays, my Shays, my dad was a bookie for 40 years. I was going to say, all right, let's, yeah, let's, let's, let's get back to that. All right. So I, yeah, I know, think of, I know think way too about much about the bookie life, the bookie life. <laughs> I mean, literally I was playing, um, gin and pinochle when I was eight years old. Um, I've been playing cards of all angles and natures since I was eight. Damn. I've been. I kind of. I was thrown out of my first casino before I was old enough to be in a casino. So for counting ever, cards. So what did that teach you about? I think it goes back to analytics and mathematical equations. Like I'm not the dopey gambler who just like puts money on like red. Um, as my friends, my boy Brian Epstein says, and gambling, I'm always looking for an edge. I'm always calculating. I'm always trying to figure out what makes the most sense, whether it's a case or betting or family life. Do I go to my, I don't want to go to my aunt's birthday party, but she wants me to go. It's inconvenient on a Saturday, but you know what? It makes sense because she'll be happy. And like, it isn't everything a balancing test. Yeah. Isn't like how many hours you work, how much money you want to make. So I think gambling shaped my life in some way. Um, not making bad bets, not making bad decisions. Um, I tell criminals all the time, you're on my probation. Does it, if you, you're on my probation for selling drugs. If you sell drugs again, what am I going to do? They look at me. I'm like, you can answer. They're like, you're going to put me in jail. I'm like, so you have to make the calculation tomorrow. Do I want to go in the corner and hustle to make $100, knowing that if I get caught, this judge is going to put me in jail for a year? Is that worth the risk? And you should, when you go out and your friend says, hey, you want to go you know, sling for an hour? You say, you know what? I get caught. I'm going upstate. It's just not worth it to me. Our whole lives are making decisions. Do I want to cross the street against the red light? If the car's at the corner moving towards me, no. If the car's three blocks away, I cross the street against the red light. Every decision we make, we make a million decisions today. So I'm, um, I'm going to jump in and ask you about what, is, what are some of the decisions, back to your parents, what are some of the decisions that they made early on in your life that made a lasting impact on not only the way that you operate in your own personal self, but the way that you treat others? Because the way that you explain it it gives me like that's in like a movie and like that that's how it was and how it should be like that's the core that's the american dream my dad was jimmy d he woke up at six in the morning he opened shays at seven he served breakfast at a cab drivers truckers and neighborhood people before work he then relinquished at about 11 to my mom he went and took a nap maybe um he then came back at seven o'clock after he was done booking after the game started and he worked till 11. <laughs> He never took a day off. He worked sick. He never stopped in his movement. He cared about other people. Um, and his work ethic is probably what I remember the most. His kindness towards others. His respect towards everyone. His understanding of other people. Um, I think that's what I carry most. My mom was a sweet woman, but she was a homemaker. She worked in the store, but she was a homemaker. She was a kind, sweet woman. Back, you know, I'm 60 already, so we're going back 50 years, 40 years. That's what women did. They weren't in the workforce as much. Um, but my dad's work ethic, kindness, and compassion for his whole life, not sometimes, but always, every day, 
every hour of the day, the consistency. Um, I'm my dad, I hope. I hope he's looking down proudly. My parents are. Uh, everything I do is reflection on them and how they raised me. And we all make mistakes. We all yell at somebody in traffic. We all cut someone off when we're having a bad day. But if you can be consistently a good person, then life's a better place to live in. For them and especially us. That's beautiful. What a, what um, I love the way that you talk about them, uh, and I love you know I can't wait to even just kind of see this and see that emotion again. You know, it's like it's it's intense, and I love it. Um, it it's fun being kind. You open a door for someone, and having them say thank you is better than like. I don't understand being in traffic and yelling out the window. Like someone crossed in front of the car in front of you. They stop. People don't stop when they're driving for no reason. They want to get to where they want to go to, too. Yeah. They stopped. It's eight seconds of your life. You don't have to honk on the horn and scream out the window. Ten seconds later, you'll be moving. So I have never screamed at anyone. Like if somebody's stupid and just pulls over in the lane of traffic um, to drink a soda, yeah, you can... But mostly people are stopping in traffic because some cause them to stop in traffic. If they didn't hit the gas when the light turned green, okay, for, yeah, tap the horn once. Say, hey, dude, time to move. You don't have to lean on the horn. It, it creates confrontation. It creates animosity. It creates negative feelings in life. Just be nice. Yeah, and it comes back. I was going to say, have you ever um, become, or not become, but uh, like when, when did you start being aware of that? Like, Because it's just starting to hit me now, which is ridiculous, it feels like, but like, you know, my grandma always used to say, it's nice to be nice. And like, I, I it's one of my favorite sayings. And I, I'm starting to think about it on a deeper level where it's like, no, wait, it's everything that I do when I go for those walks. And because that's the thing, it's like that, that start to the day is so important for me because it sets me up. You, you me walk through the mood. hallway, say hello to people, have five minutes before you go for your walk. You're just in a better frame of mind. Yeah. For, and when you're in a better frame of mind, you're more productive as an employee. You're more productive when you make that call because you're not like mailing in like, hey, uh, what did you, did you get the invoice? What do you think about it? If you have a better outlook on your own life and you're in a better place, the conversations you have will be more productive. Yeah. And, and, and the energy that you give off just comes right back at you. And the energy that you give off comes right back at you. And you asked me, when did I realize this? Probably about 15 minutes ago. I don't know. Like, <laughs> like I've always been nice. I know I felt good about being nice, but I'm not the most mature guy. I'm not the most introspective guy. Do you care about that? Wow, that's a tough question. Um, I would like to talk less and think more. Um, but I think it's too late for that at 60. Um, I'm trying to be better. At, I'm not a bad listener. I think I've become a better listener. I've always cared about what other people, what my impact of my words and actions had on others and try to, try to explain understand why they're doing things like my mother-in-law um, loves going out on Saturdays to go to yard sales, but it's more than just not wanting to see her grandchild or, you know, not doing something. It's what she needs. She works all week. She doesn't see her friends. Putting yourself in someone else's shoes isn't as easy. We're always quick to judge. It's not easy for a judge not to be quick to judge, yeah. <laughs> but I'm trying to, I think that's another thing I would tell you, your generation your way is not the right way. Your way is your way. It's your truth, as you like to say. Try to understand why other people do it. Uh, my friend Shane, Shane, he has an 18-year-old son. I'm going to his graduation tomorrow. He's going to, I imagine he's going to be drafted in the pros. I won't say his name. He might be like a first-rounder. And his mom wanted to wear... What sport are we talking? Baseball. Got the biggest um, sp um, scholarship Rutgers has ever given. All Different. world represented Pennsylvania, travels the, the country playing baseball, lives it. What a great kid. What a great family. And they get along great. And his mom at his graduation wanted to wear like a shirt with his name on it and bring posters. And they couldn't understand. He's like, mom, don't do that. Like, and they had like a little bit of a tiff. And then the family couldn't understand why he wouldn't want that. And they couldn't understand why he wouldn't want it. And then I explained to my boy Shane, his father, and I said, He's an adult. He has a girlfriend. He's going to college. He wants to be drafted by the pros. I don't want mom with a poster saying, Evan's graduating. Like, you got to explain to your wife that that's not, like, she sees as a kid. Yeah. He's not a kid. That's juvenile for him. And you guys got to treat him more like an adult. And he's got to realize that mom raised him, sacrificed for him. And you got to sit down saying, hey, mom's doing this because she's going to miss you while you're off at college. And he's got to realize you're going to have to do things for mom that you don't want to do. Yeah. And if mom wants to wear your, her, your name on the back of her jersey, 
that's okay. Get rid of the posters. Yeah. And once they understood each other, they hugged it out and couldn't realize that they didn't understand each other's perspective. Yeah. So maybe that too. Get off your fucking phone <laughs> and enjoy. <laughs> think. Use your brains, and don't be so quick to react. Yeah. And, and don't so be hard. so influenced. How about this? Don't be so effing influenced about what's on social media just because some moron in LA decides like, something. Like that's not the right way. But that's, that's the thing. Is like ha like that's like what I like. We had a. Uh, a, a kid he's 17 years old and named george payroon and hosts an unbelievable podcast um and he had i was asking about all these problems and he, the kid's brilliant brilliant but he said to me he's like we talk so much about the problems we never talk about the solutions and it's like how do we how do we do what do we do it's like yeah don't be so influenced but like this is the world that we live in now there, there's like and again these these algorithms and all these things are more um powerful than our brains they know us better than we know ourselves in a lot of ways they have a history of our life <laughs> like, no i mean they know i always want to know this so we'll i said to our podcast five times i guarantee when i pick up my phone there's going to be some advertisement for a podcast yes yeah i'll, I'll say this word cruise we should go on a cruise cruises are great royal princess is great disney cruises are great it's going to pop up on my phone in like an hour. Mm -hmm. How many times have you had a conversation with somebody and I don't know how they do algorithms. I think they're allowed to listen to our phone maybe and pick up words or keywords. Everything that you've typed, everybody that you've messaged, it also understands that where you are geolocation wise, what everybody, you know, I was, <laughs> I remember I was telling my we dad. We said the word cheesesteak four times. I bet you we're going to have cheesesteak yeah. ads come up. Yeah. And Shay's cheesesteaks. <laughs> yes. Yeah, get that. Shay's, get that. Watch this, watch this. Shay's cheesesteaks, Shay's cheesesteaks, Shay's cheesesteaks. Dad, I'm sorry. Shay's cheesesteaks, Shay's cheesesteaks. Uh, it, um, <laughs> we're going to get, we're going to get some, like I said, we're going to get some B-roll in there. And, no, and, I don't um, you got, you got, we'll, we'll, we're going to get to the stakes. They, they, no, they, I'm in no rush to get to the stakes. This is just a good conversation yeah. I'm having. Um, just free rolling or, you know, we got to get out of the trans, what is it again? Transhumanist. <laughs> Being Movement. those kind of people and having conversations. I mean, I challenge people to look how many texts they have a day compared to how many phone calls they have a day. I bet it's 10 to 1, right? Yeah. Is it 10 to 1? Of uh, the time that you spend on text compared to the time you spend Spend I mean, talking with to group someone. chats, and that's another thing. Like, this is the kind I'm not of even saying group, I'm just saying written word on your phone as opposed to spoken word to a person. I think 10 to 1 might be underselling. What do you think that number is? Underselling, yes, underselling. Because I was going to say, like, group chats, like, I could wake up to a 78 text message from a group chat if I and you don't call anyone back, you just text them back. Yeah, and I and I try. Now, what's that going to do interpersonally? Later on, like well, this is 10 years, 20 years from now. And this is the thing. This is what I'm saying is that I don't think we talk enough about what is actually happening in this world. Nobody we, stepped back enough to actually analyze that. Yes. And, our, our lives are going to be forever changed in a negative way. Uh, well, I don't, I'm, I, I, I am, I call myself an eternal optimist. I always think like we can get all intense about these problems. I'm an and optimist, these things. by the way. It might not sound it in the last hour, but <laughs> um, and then but everything the comes back is ninety percent full for me. Yeah, yeah. Everything comes back to center. Like we talked about balance. Like if we want, if we really think we're going to start changing, you know, because there's so. All right, so he, he, I'm trying to break this this down in the best way possible. All right, so when we grew up, and I was on AIM, was like our first our first introduction to like what would be social media for my age. I'm 28 years old. AIM. Uh, yeah. So like instant messenger from AOL. Oh, I got I don't it. Know if you ever had yeah. that, I did. So that's how we, you know, kept we had that with the chisel and the in the, in the tablet. <laughs> yeah. Do I ever have it? Yeah. The fuck. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Little ageism. Um, <laughs> a lot of ages. Like, thank you. Do you know AIM, like instant messenger? <laughs> yes. Have you ever been I on the internet? before you did. Have you ever been on the internet? Yeah, once or twice. <laughs> um, so people, you know, adults would think, oh, you guys are wasting your time on that. You're wasting your time on that. You're wasting your time on that. How do we do business now on Slack, on, on Microsoft Teams? It's just AIM. We're going to be working. And what are kids doing right now? They're playing Roblox. They're playing video games. They're living in these worlds. They're streaming. That's what our life is going to be in 20 years when they get here. We're Sadly, going to be working in these metaverse type things. And that's, it's just what, it's what happens every time. It, it, this, this stuff to me, like, 
Yeah, uh, go watch like Blade Runner 2099 or something. That's where we're going to be. It's like message boards and, you know, video prostitutes and um, like everywhere you walk, there's some sign. And every time you pick up your phone, it's sponsored by the cab. Like go watch like one of those fruit trays yeah. movies and see if that's where you want to be. But I look lens. at that. I'm like, please don't let that be. But I, but I don't even like, I'm not mad about it because I'm not going to stop it. You're not mad about it because you don't know what it should be. But what is it supposed to be? Do any of us know what it should be? You don't. That's your first point to me. Uh, an answer I probably tried to answer, but just rambled on was what difference was it from when you were younger to now? Um, we played ball. We communicated. We cared about each other in ways and in depths that you can't understand by texting and communicating being digital media and <sighs> It's good for some people who are outgoing, but generally speaking, human interaction is what drives us and makes us happy, not digital communications and metaverses. Yeah. Yes, you can be happy on your computer playing video for an hour, but it's all about work-life balance, play-life balance. And if your balance is so imbalanced by being on your phone and watching TV and playing games, then again, find some futuristic movie where you're like living uh, a trailer and your whole life is about video games and video messaging and TV and movies and FaceTime. Yeah. And that's a lonely existence. You don't get the depth of our conversation for 15 minutes um, when we're outside or caring about another person or somebody bringing home eight cheesesteaks to Indiana because they love their cheesesteaks. They went to Target, got a box, drove them home, called me when they got to Indiana, told me how much their girlfriend liked, liked them. The, the UAW worker who came in his, with his wife, who we talked about it, and she didn't have anything to do while they were at meetings, and I took her to court, and she watched for a couple of hours. And then he texted me last night that it made their trip. I, I have five or six texts, Now I'm going back. I read the text, I communicate, and then I move on in life. From the last um, few hours... Mary and I just made it home. We ended up leaving the hotel yesterday and went to Jersey. We went to the Aquarium and drove to New York for the 9-11 Memorial. We drove back through Times Square and headed back to Michigan this morning. Thanks again for all your hospitality and your new friendship. You made our trip very memorable. <laughs> that's like, awesome. Like, that's what... Yeah. And then I got, like, a little chill for half hour. I got a high from it, my endorphins. And I said, thank you so much. What a pleasure. You are the people, the real people I love getting to know, hanging with for a few days hoping our paths will cross again. Tell Mary I said thanks. That's awesome. Like, this is what I like to do in life. Like, that's a small interpersonal three or four day interaction, but that can happen with grandmom. How many people, you young guys, have seen grandmom, brought her some flowers, some cookies, her favorite cake, go see your aunt, go watch your nephew's baseball game, go watch your five-year-old try to play soccer. Like, Get the F out of your house. Get off your phone. Get off your couch. Yeah. Go get some fresh air. Go see a family member or friend. Reach out via text. Facebook was great because initially the goal was to reconnect people from high school and college and growing up. But then it became all-knowing, all-powerful. And that's all you did. Get to know someone. Meet them for lunch. And that's Don't the, stay on it for, eight, for more hours. And again, that's the real talk that I'm trying to have is that like it, it starts out, the, the intentions are good They're to interconnect people. But- the way that our society is built is built to make more money. And how do you keep, like once you keep put pressing and pushing the ball down that lane, it's going to like, I'm not surprised. Like that's what, what I'm trying to say. It's like, none of this is surprising. So let's take a step back, address it, understand why. Because I believe that, like you said about like the trailer. Don't just make less money. Don't make money, just less. Yes, yeah. And that's, but it's going to, like, I'm with you. Same thing on the advertising. It's the pendulum is going to swing back because everyone is, as I think people are getting to where it's like, wait, we don't will it or will we become more dependent and teach our kids to be more dependent and just how many how many times have you walked around and and when your child cries instead of saying what's wrong let's play a game get on your floor and toss the ball here's their phone the ipad and yeah. give them an ipad and just click the button and then they get on instagram and face um instagram and facebook just because their kid was needed attention so they put something in front of them they'll get used to that so you can be on facebook and then that relationship won't be as loving i think Correct. it's going to be very negative you think yeah. you i'm an optimist you're an optimist 
I'm a realist. But no, no, but I, I, I agree with you is what I'm saying is I think it's going to get so bad that it eventually has to snap back. And yes, there will be people and there will be families that don't snap back. But there's also going to be another section of people that realize that and understand, no, I don't want to give my kid an iPad at two oh, years that's old. all they understand. Like alcoholics have alcoholic children, fathers who beat their children, those children grow up to beat their children. Yes. So I don't know. I just, I just, I don't, you're being an optimist. I think that you're wrong. I just could, I, th- I just think good wins out in the end. And, and I, I take, ah. a, I take a 100 year view on it. I'm not talking about. Well, you know what? Next time I take my walk, I'm going to look at it more analytically. I'm going to do a 50 year. <laughs> I don't think I'll be around in 50. Can I, I can get the 110. Why not? Um, you got to, Get more people to listen, more people to think, more people to react, more people to analyze. Yeah. We got to get you bigger and better. That's it's a great show. That's what we're trying to do. I'm just, <laughs> well, well, you're you're helping it. Um, but yeah. that remains to be seen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I do want to um, I do want to jump into again. You know, after touching on on your family, talking about Shea steaks because I will. I'm going to shoot you straight, just as you're shooting me straight. When I got the cheese steak. I was like, okay, this is an expensive cheesesteak. Oh yeah, twenty dollar cheesesteak. Twenty dollar cheesesteak. It's half the size of a of a Gino's cheesesteak. Let's not get crazy. We're eight inches. They're ten. It, <laughs> so if we do the but, math, that's sixteen percent smaller. But it looked so like I come upstairs and I'm like, all right, like we just you know this is a pretty pretty pricey place down there. We got the cheapest of the you know you got some some premium what? premium ones. But I understood as soon as I took a bite, I was like, oh, <laughs> like I get it. So I'm gonna go back to that theory, and if anybody listens to that, um analysis someone tell them how wrong they are see i like to think i'm a chef and i think it's all about balance like in life like in food um watching the shows on tv and i don't watch many food shows is what's the hero of the sandwich i remember some one of the chefs saying that the hero of a steak sandwich is steak okay. not the bread so i actually give more meat than yes. casinos we give eight and a half to nine ounces yes we use a smaller roll because, and we hollow the roll because you should have the taste of the bread. You should taste the texture of the bread and um, the seeds in the bread. And we all love bread, but the steak is, it's called a cheese steak. It's not called a bread steak. It's not called a bread sandwich. <laughs> so it's an eight inch or seven inch roll, but it has nine ounces of steak. Gino's has seven or seven and a half. We have eight or eight, eight and a half or nine. So it's a small roll, but with more food, because I believe that you should have a culmination of flavors, mostly steak. And as my friend Jerry Stanshine says, mostly steak, flavor with the cheese, flavor with the seasoning, flavor with the onions, flavor with the peppers and the bread. And there should be the right person. Again, remember how I told you I'm mathematical, like yeah, yeah. in life, what percentages should be steak? 50% steak, 10% cheese, peppers, onions, seasoning and roll. And then it should all come together with the hero being the steak. It shouldn't be over seasoned, over cheesed. I gave, I like to give over to cheese because I love cheese. Who doesn't <laughs> love cheese? But I give Jerry a little extra cheese because he's my boy. He's like, it was too much cheese. You were trying to take care of me, but it had too much of the flavor of what I was trying to enjoy. And since he gave me that advice, I've taught all my chefs, balance, what are we trying to achieve? We want it to kind of explode in your mouth yes, of the that's, flavors. That's exactly what happened. So that's what I'm saying. As soon as I took the first bite, I was like, oh, this was crafted. This that, well, wasn't- it's called Shea Steaks Custom Crafted. I don't know if you know that. Oh, no, I didn't. I uh, didn't our that. shirts, we just got 500 shirts ordered. Shea Steaks Custom Crafted under it. I didn't know Did that. you really say that? No, I know. I really didn't know that. Um, custom Crafted Cheese Steaks. But that's what I'm saying. Because I like I, I like Geno's and like, but this, and, and, and legitimately, and I-, I I love Del Sandro's. It's like just a lot of whole meat, but yeah. it's different when you cook with prime rib. It's more money because, and we cook, we do orders. We'll do catering 200. I can't give you, if I did 200 cheesesteaks at once and gave you prime rib, I would need an armored truck to buy 400 pounds of prime rib. But sirloin and ribeye cost less than prime rib. We give non-frozen prime rib. Prime rib costs more. So I passed that along to you, but you can taste the difference. And same thing, yeah. Cooper Sharp American costs more than the sliced pasteurized American <laughs> New Yorker. Sharp. It's all about um, Cooper Sharp. Cooper <laughs> Sharp all- cheese. This show's rolls cost 20 cents more than any other roll, but it's worth it. Yes. So yeah, you're going to pay a little extra and it's not for everybody. I had sirloin on my menu. When, our first week I had sirloin. When you put them on the grill and you break it up with your spatula, when you put prime rib, I can put a hundredth of a percent 
of pressure and it just breaks apart. When I had the sirloin and we'd put it on freshly sliced, you literally broke a sweat trying to break the pieces apart. I'm like, it's not, and it tasted like that. If you can't break it apart, then it's going to be chewier. What makes steak, do you know what makes steak no. taste good? No, I, I can't chef for Do you know what, my life. what makes a steak taste good? Um, Does anybody know? The I would assume the do, do, the do, time do, on the grill. Do, do, the, do, 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 what, what is it? Do, the marbling of the meat, the fat within the meat. Not the fat on the outside. Like if you look at a steak and there's white in it, that's the fat in the meat itself. That's called marbling. The more marbling of the meat, and I'll show you a picture that nobody can see. The, get on your dopey phones and look up the word marbling. We can, we'll drop it in. We'll. Um, so marbling of a Wagyu, it's like half red, half white. Okay. That fat within the, the meat makes it flavorful. Prime rib has the second most. New York strip. Um, sirloin has none. It's just a big slab of red. So it's just leather. Yeah. Um, so the more marbling, um, the more flavor. And the key to, you're partly right how long you cook it for. If you keep it on the grill too long, which every Pat's Gino's, Los Angeles, that the big thing of steak sitting on the grill. Well, they're cooking that fat out of it. They're cooking the flavor out of the steak. Yeah. Why do people, what, what's the most common temperature people eat their steaks when they go to a real restaurant? Medium? Medium rare? Medium rare. Medium rare. Why? Because they don't cook the fat out of it. <laughs> the fat's the flavor. You make it well done, the fat's gone and it doesn't have any flavor. You're eating rawhide. Rare and medium rare have the most flavor because the fat's still within the marbling. Medium has a slight pink center. I'm going to show you this. You talk for a second while I yeah. scroll through my phone and find saying, you the picture. You, you can send a, send a picture to me and we'll, we'll drop it in the video. When, you, when people see it, they will immediately understand. You see the marbling? Oh, wow. So the, the, the white stuff. I can see it from here. You see all that white? Yeah. That's all the flavor. You keep it on the grill too much. If you look at sirloin, it's just red. Look at the marbling on that. Damn, that's beautiful. You see that, young man? That's the <laughs> flavor. So that costs more because that's only on a... That, look at what Wagyu Damn. looks like. I had no idea. This melts in your mouth. You don't have to chew it. You take your first bite and you swallow it. That marbling, as opposed to a sirloin, which is just an ugly, solid red. That's um, incredible. So you have to pay more for it. I don't mind charging $19 yeah. because I'm giving you a better quality steak. So I probably should have started out with this. I don't know if you ever saw my review that I put on, online, but I said- I see every review. I said, please don't let the price I saw deter it. you from- Because like that's what naturally- like I, I, I saw a, a group of people. I think they were like- It's like when the volleyball thing was happening at the convention center. And there was a group of people that came by, looked at the menu, and they're like, oh, those are so expensive. Yep. And I was like, I'm sure people think that. But then, like, would you have? I mean, again, like I said, it's a, it's an experience. And I was like, I've been telling Pam. That's good. <laughs> he, I showed him a picture. He moved away from the microphone <laughs> yeah, to grab my like, phone. <laughs> I showed him a hundred pounds of New York strip and a hundred pounds of Damn. prime rib. What it looks like? It's not ribeye that you get at every other restaurant. We serve prime rib. It's a special red stamp. It's a different cut of meat. It's a different taste. It's just so flavorful. Um, and then you season that like a real steak because. You go to Patsy's Del Sanjo, you squirt it with oil and ketchup. When you go to um, Capitol Grill and um, Del Frisco's, you don't dare put ketchup on their prime rib. You season it. We have 16 different seasonings because when you're eating prime rib, you eat with red garlic jalapeno or, you know, or a buttery steakhouse or black garlic and truffle. A flavored prime rib um, cheesesteak is better than the Gino's Del Sanjo's gym. That's great, too. Yeah. But you know what that's great for? A hangover. That's what I, so I've been saying. I was like, I, the, you G want a hangover steak? Go to Jim's, man. Go to Del Sandro's. I was going to say, fantastic. Gino's, Gino's is to me like a drunk Uber Eats kind of enjoyable experience. We get people traveling from all over the country. We have that map of the world. We have people coming from Ocean City, New Jersey, New York. They see our reviews. We, so we have a Wagyu cheesesteak. We, I'm, I have to change the price. After, I'm going to do one more $34 Wagyu cheesesteak because Barclay Prime charges $140. But mine's better. It's yeah. the same Wagyu. They just charge 140. Yeah, we charge 35, which is a lot for a cheesesteak. We're gonna. We're, I'm getting there Monday. 50 pounds of Wagyu, and I'm gonna. The next 75 people are gonna get a 30 dollar Wagyu cheesesteak, 
and they'll never. I'm, I'm going to ruin their lives. <laughs> it literally melts in your mouth. Damn, I, I, I want to try it after. after oh, this. it's insane! You saw the marbling, right? Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. You you would never dare put ketchup on that. So what is it? All right. So what is it? A couple different questions. What we're gonna, we're going to start with the the competition because obviously, feel like, like there is that, none. Let's go. I love that. I was going to say you you can confidently say you've got the best cheesesteak in Philadelphia. Yeah, not because I'm. A, I'm going the wheels. I, did I do the wheels analogy? I already did it, right? No. I didn't do the wheels analogy. So we invented the wheel 10,000 BC or something like that, right? The wheel. You see the caveman drawings with the big stone wheel. And we use wheels to move heavy things. Um, luggage has been heavy since the first person tried to move luggage hundreds, maybe thousands of years ago in the Renaissance. 500 years ago in Rome, people had luggage to go from one home to the other. Um, you're not old enough, but anybody over 45 will know that we used to have to carry our luggage through airports. You went with a family, you have to go get a porter, give them a 20 or you're going to be late for your hotel. And then someone said, let's put wheels on luggage. <laughs> See, something's heavy and you put wheels on it, you can roll it through the airport. You only know wheels on luggage, right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, You don't know anything other than wheels and luggage. That's the last 15 years. Um, nobody knows that you don't have to freeze meat to have it in a restaurant. When you buy 100, 200 pounds, the meat purveyors drop it off in the morning. We ran out of meat twice this week. We got 100 pounds dropped off on Monday. We sliced down all the prime rib New York strip. When it was done, we were done. Um, why do you have to serve so that- frozen meat? Why can't you slice the meat that day? Does anybody think that frozen meat's better than non-frozen meat? So you're is willing to, the, to run out of meat in order to... Well, now we're ordering 200 pounds because yeah, yeah. I don't own a freezer, but we own a refrigerator. Meat can be refrigerated for five days. Maybe we go into a second day with our meat, but it's vacuum sealed. And yeah. so maybe we go into the second day, but we never freeze it. So let's go, let's go over the five things we do differently. What's better, frozen meat or non-frozen meat? Non-frozen. What's better... Um, sirloin with no marbling or prime rib prime rib what's better when you cook with oil or you cook with butter everybody cooks steaks with butter if you don't know uh, what's don't know. better when you season a steak or you don't season a steak is seasoning seasoning is better you get the flavor of the seasoning whether it's regular or you don't go and they just give you the meat it's seasoned with butter or garlic yeah, or yeah. red garlic jalapeno or a hundred different that's what i have the red garlic jalapeno and then <laughs> what's better when the steak's been on the grill for 40 minutes and you walk in they take it out of the pile or they put it on for you fresh when you walk in yeah put it on so those are the five things we do we never freeze it we slice it every couple hours we cook it with butter it's not on the grill you know drying out and we're giving you a better cut of meat for three extra dollars. Yeah. Come to Shays. We'll treat you to it. We have 219 reviews as of today, 217 five star. I was going to say, you have a, a ridiculous. We were 5.0 until one of the competitors gave me one star. Oh. It was funny. Like you said, our place is dirty. We're, we're like a, a hospital, like a doctor's office. We're so clean down there. So you can tell it's from a local pizza shop. Because he only has one review. He gave us one star for food, one star for cleanliness, and one star for atmosphere. Damn. Well, so, that's definitely not true in the atmosphere. So that's why we came down to 4.95. <laughs> or we, we were solid 5.0. Yeah. Because it, I'm not a great chef. I just had a pretty good idea that let's serve fresh, good food. Put, and by the way, we put it on the best roll in the area, Lesios. I tried Amorosas, which is great. I tried Sarcones, which is great. And they drop them off every day. They drop them off twice a day. Oh, really? I was, just, I was saying, I always... And they're hot when they... Like, it's pass them all. a fresh roll that... We don't have to go into yesterday's rolls or free... People freeze rolls. We don't freeze our rolls. We don't freeze our steak. We don't. We cut our onions five times a day. We cut our peppers five times a day. We cut our cheese five times a day. You have one of eight... You're in the mood for pepper jack or mozzarella or Cooper Sharp or... Mer- we have a homemade cheese with... It's just so much fun creating food. Yeah. I, I hate when people... We cheer when they say we're going to eat in because I want to see the smile on your face when you take your first bite saying, and by the way, it's steaming hot until your last bite. People are like, why is this still steam coming out? Because it's never been frozen. When food is frozen, remember that marbling I told you about? It freezes. You put it on the grill, it immediately dehydrates and starts drying out. So it gets cold quicker. Our steaks stay hot pretty much till the last bite. Steam comes out of them still if you eat inside. This is so funny. I'm a little passionate. Well, that, well, that's Just a, a little thing. bit. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. That's what I saw immediately. But I, um, the funny thing, like what I like is that you have made a lot of decisions. Again, back to the gambling side of things. You've made a lot of decisions that have been consistent. That you're willing, again, if, if you're out of meat a half percent of the time, 
to be able to provide fresh steaks 99.5% of the time, you're willing to take that gamble where everybody, and you're willing to take a couple minutes. Like you're going to wait a couple minutes instead of have it, you know, in 30 seconds where you're just going down the line and picking one up. All right, do me a favor. Read what I'm texting. I'm texting while I'm talking. So I'm talking to a guy who owns Jinta's, G-U-I-N-T-A at the Reading Terminal. It's the premium meat purveyor, back right corner Reading Terminal. So uh, what did I say? You have meat or something like that? Yeah, you have some meat for me. What did he say? Yeah, you want strips? Yes. They up here. KK, there in an hour. Okay. Want like four pieces. Yes, please. That four pieces is four 25-pound pieces of New York strip. So that's 100 pounds we're going to pick up in about an hour because <laughs> we only have 75 pounds left, which is going to be gone by about 6 o'clock. So I need another 100 pounds. That's me picking up, ordering while we're talking, yeah. texting him. I'll be there in an hour to pick up 100 pounds in New York Strip. We got 75 pounds of prime. I was going to say, if anybody's yesterday. watching the video, we're, we're talking to Scott on his busiest, probably probably your busiest day, right? Saturdays? Yes, I just were swamped from yeah. the morning to night. We have people, you were watching at 10 in the morning. People were coming <laughs> in at 10 in the morning buying cheesesteaks. Yeah, it's that good. Well, um, thank you. What, um... What is it that, again, so we, we went to the quality of your shop. What is it that the Geno's and Pat's and all these classic places have gotten right? Because obviously they're doing something right. We can't say that they're not, you know, they've, they've made chili, Philly cheesesteaks a thing. What they, what they got right was they came up with the idea. Thank you, Geno's. Thank you, Pat's. Thank you for making the cheesesteak the most popular sandwich in America. The pop, most popular food. One of the reasons I thought, my wife said, are we going to make money? I'm like, I have no idea. But... I'll challenge anyone out there. This will be a little game that you don't have to be on your phone. You'll have to use your brains. Um, what food is more iconic to any city in America other than a cheesesteak to Philadelphia? There's deep dish to Chicago, but nobody comes in and says, I'm in Chicago. I got to get deep dish. Um, we have people from all over the world. Yeah. 50 countries in the last seven days. A hundred cities in the last seven days have come in because they need a cheesesteak. So I thank Gino's and Pat's for popularizing. You go to Vegas, Philly Child's cheesesteak. You go to Croatia, Philly Child's cheesesteak. You go to Puerto Rico, Philly Child's cheesesteak. You go to Los Angeles. Everything's on the menu everywhere in the yeah. world. Philly, and they're what, not really close when you go out there to other No, but, <laughs> but everybody like, knows about it. Yeah, yeah. What other food is associated with any other city in America? There's nothing. There's the nothing. crepe in Paris. I was going to say. Crepes in Paris. Um, New England clam chowders, and probably. But that's not a city. Yeah, yeah, just that's a whole region um, or an area. Name a food. There's Chicago deep dish, but you don't have to get that. There's buffalo wings, but nobody travels to Buffalo to get wings. Yeah, yeah. Someone's just created there. Um, New York pizza, but nobody. So do you, you go to New York and say, ever. "I have to have a slice of pizza"? A lot of people do, but not like the Philly cheesesteak. So I yeah. thank them for that. And then they got lazy, and then they got content, and then everybody copied them, but nobody. Name one restaurant that seasons a cheesesteak. Del Sandro's, Pat's, Jimmy's, Gino's, Angelo's. So Nobody. You, do you have Why can't you put seasoning on meat? <laughs> People have been seasoning on meat for thousands of years. Why did it take me to say, let's put red garlic jalapeno seasoning or red garlic chili? We just got an 11 pepper jalapeno. How about um, black garlic and truffle? It's not hard. Kinder's makes the best seasonings. Put seasonings on cheesesteaks and then let you pick your cheese not just whiz or without how yeah. about we give you cooper sharp or pepper jack or mozzarella or one of the other eight cheeses we have you can go american you can go our homemade whiz my wife's like we, we're putting whiz i'm like over my dead body and then we compromise on a homemade whiz which is a blend of cooper sharp american rick or jalapeno some steak some seasonings which i will not divulge um <laughs> And we make a homemade whiz for somebody who just wants that experience. But why did we the first person to season a cheesesteak to cut it fresh, to give you prime rib, to give you wagyu? Why? They got lazy. They got content. It's easy to tell cheesesteaks. Everybody comes to Philly and wants one to give it. I have people who do test us. They're like, on my daughter's lives, I have two beautiful daughters, Gabriel, Emma, Remy, James. If it hasn't been five times this week, Thank God we came to Philly because we heard about these cheesesteaks and we've been so disappointed. Thank God we came here before we left. That's awesome. That's a tr I'll, I'll, I'll start recording them. 
Look at my reviews. Yeah, I mean, the reviews just go it. on Google and look at the reviews. They're not just five stars. It's five stars and like, so, oh my so God. You, do you think you can be the biggest shop in Philly? We are the best. I don't know if we'll ever be the biggest because I don't want to be the biggest. I want to be the best. I want to. Yeah. I tell my guys, if people have to wait 10 minutes, so be it. It has to be a five-star product. They usually have lines. We have kiosks where you're hand custom crafting. Mm -hmm. They have lines before you order. It might take us five to 10 to 15 minutes to make it because we're making it fresh for you. Yeah. Um, but we'll never be the biggest because I don't want to be. I just want to have the best quality. And not everybody can pay $20 for a cheesesteak. Yeah. Um, but we will continue to be the best because nobody makes a cheesesteak like ours. Uh, it just doesn't exist. Uh, nobody yeah. puts nine ounces of, of prime rib with Cooper Sharp fresh onions and peppers that we just do five times a day. It's not in our fridge for weeks. It's never nothing. We don't have a, not only don't we have a freezer, we don't have like a can opener because there's nothing to open with a can. That's my next part. Never frozen, never opened with a can opener. Like it's all, our mushrooms are fresh. Our onions are fresh. We went from doing a 50 pound sack a week to doing 200 pounds of onions every week. Damn. And it is the one thing, the other thing I noticed is the, uh, the sauces. Yeah. The seasonings, the sauces, like you're oh. again, paying for quality stuff. You could just throw like, garbage in there and we it makes, use it makes a little sweet baby rays if you know what that is or is, is our like our buffalo sauce a sweet baby rays like buffalo garlic sauce it costs me more money yeah and i do pass it along to the consumer but it's just better yeah and if you want cheap go to gino's and it sounds again it sounds funny but like you are creating memories you're creating you're oh, creating like a really important part go of on i challenge you tonight yeah. when you can't sleep i have or when I, you take your walk yeah. read the 200 reviews it's like it made our trip better. It made our experience better. We look forward to it. And that's why I'm doing it. It's a combination of my dad, yeah, combination yeah. of the way I was raised, combination like the police people. And you know what's really fun? I've always cooked for my friends and family. Having people pay for something I make, it's kind of a mind fuck. It's cool. Really? And that makes me want to be better. <laughs> God, you're paying for the food I'm giving you. It better be good. Would you remember when we met in the elevator before... And was I was just, that you're I, not that good looking, dude. I was just, no, I was and, just and some nor, random. Not that I have any problem with it, but you're not my type. I, yeah. I was just some random guy to you, but I don't know if it was like if I had my eyes squinty or something like that, but. Might be those eyes me. and that smile. You are kind of you, <laughs> you looked at me and you, you go, you're going to be one of my customers. And I like, took my headphone out. I was like, what? And you were like, yeah, I own the cheesesteak shop downstairs. So like, what about it? What about me says like, I'm going to be your guy because I am like, I, like, I mean. <laughs> The amount well, of the amount I spend well, on, on uh, delivery and DoorDash and well, all that Well, that's another junk thing about like, the prices that you talked about. I got McDonald's the other day. Like we were just craving it. Yeah. It was seventeen dollars for like a patty of yeah. hamburger. That you're not was, that far off. It was it's just horrible. The sticker shock. And, and again, for the experience, for what you're getting for that money, it's. And and, and guess what? I don't want to make the fifteen dollar cheesesteak. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just not to make a fifteen dollar cheesesteak with rent in Center City with employees that I'm paying. Double minimum wage. That's why they work so hard. Yeah, they make double minimum. I say they seem. That's a, I've, I've brought this up before, and I so brought pleasant. up with, with Blaze. I said like the way you treat your employees, it's so clear. And I've worked in restaurants, so it's like it's so obvious when your employees, and especially in that service type setting, are angry, having a bad day, upset. They're just trying to get through the day. Like it, it translates to no, the entire building. No, they bought in. So every one of my employees down there opened the shop with me. I found Cashley, beautiful young girl. Um, she was working in Walgreens. I walked in. She, I dropped something. She picked it up for me. Sir, can I help you? Uh, do you want this? And again, let's not leave out. She works the county. Beautiful young girl. One of the considerations. I'm not going to be a liar. <laughs> and she was so helpful and so personable. And I said, what do they pay you? And I said, I'm going to pay you $3 an hour more. Please come work for me. And then she looked at me and I said, oh, I'm married with a child. Here's pictures. I'm not trying to pick you up. They're going to be in the studio all the time. This is completely professional. Please come work for me. I need people like you. Yeah. And she bought in. So I'm going to Italy. This is, we're a family down there. They, they're building this. They're so proud that we're number one and we have a 4.98 Google. If we get a four rating, we research who they are. Like they yeah. want yeah. us to be great. They want, they don't work for me. They work for us. They get paid well, but they care. And if you get employees that care, they make a better product. It's a nicer environment. And I said to her, and Alex, this morning, I didn't know I can go to Italy. I had planned to go to Italy with my wife and daughter for my 60th. I wanted to go away for three weeks. 
you open up a cheesesteak shop, that new for 50 days, and they're so on point, they're so good. When I'm there, they're great. When I'm not there, you know, they're employees and they want to look at their phones and not, you know, fill up the soda machine. <laughs> but I said to Cashley last night, I said, I know you can do the job. I know you're great at your job. Seven out of eight hours. Could you be great if I go to Italy? She said, I'll be great. And I said, I'm going to be away for 14 days. How many of those 14 days can you work for me, Cashley? Because you're really good. She said, I'll work all 14. I choked up. I just choked up now. So Alex this morning, great chef, managed like a Chili's. Loves it, loves our camaraderie. I said, Alex, I need you to step up. You, he's my best employee. Like, he doesn't stop. Like, I, I'm away 14. How many days can you work? He looked at me and says, all 14, chef. I literally had a tear in my eye, man. And I'm going to tell Ray and Mason, they're going to say the same thing. And that's what we're building. We're building camaraderie, kindness, great fucking food. Yeah. And um, just, I'm proud of them. I'm proud of the idea. I'm proud to be here on my first podcast. Yeah. <laughs> how, how am I doing, by the way? Great. Unbelievable. I'm talking Unbelievable. way too much. So, but no, it's oh, so much easier on me. So much easier. <laughs> you um, don't have to, I told you when, before we started, you're not going <laughs> yeah, like, to have to fight for words. You're yeah. not going to have to fight to pull words out of me. You're like, you're like don't even tell me anything. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you said take, we should prep. Quick, I'm like, we're good. We'll take a quick time out. Time out. All right, so a quick update. Scott got some text calls that he was running out of meat down here at the shop. So we are down here. We're about to go on a trip with him to pick up, I think, like 100 pounds of steak. Um, so we're going to get uh, some shots of the shop. Uh, Scott's doing a sales job right now, showing everybody the map that he was talking about. But thanks so much for checking out the episode. Uh, come on down to Shea Steaks. It's unbelievable. We're about to uh, eat some after that. But we'll hop back on in a little bit. See you. We're number one. You're wait, damn. Let's go. We're number. We're number it's not even close. The highest rating is four point six. We're four nine five. Dude, let's go. And we go. have 220 reviews as of this morning. It is. That's unreal. And not only are they leaving a review, brother, they're going to the British Airways and saying, yes. "We're putting on our website anybody who comes to Philly for a layover and wants a cheesesteak, yes, go to Shays." Well, that's what I was talking about being because like it's. It's just naturally going to evolve that way if you have the best cheesesteak in Philadelphia. And no, it's evolving. Films. I mean, we have all, so all the United and Southwest pilots stay there and they put it on their website. We get anywhere between five and 10 airline employees a day between the pilot, mostly the pilots, because it is a $20 cheesesteak. Um, not as many as the um, flight attendants because they don't make as much. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the guys I gave him a free steak, he was like, you know, I try to save up so I can eat well. I said, it's on me. He's like, Damn. he's freaking out. That's awesome. My dad would do something like that. That's sweet. Yeah. And that's all, again, like uh, what, the, what we try to get across on the podcast is where people come from, why they do the things I give they everybody do. Oreos. Did you see that? They're like, what? <laughs> like Oreos. They think, in other words, I can get a case of Oreos, they're 45 cents a pack. So yeah. If I can make somebody smile because they pay $20 for a cheesesteak. Yes. But get a pack of Oreos or chocolate strawberry. Or yeah. Why not? It's just. Why not? Yeah. So it's a customer mutually, might bottom line by 50 cents. It's mutually beneficial. Check, check. All right, we're all check. good. Um, all right, so first uh, first episode to ever have a uh, ping pong game at halftime. Yeah, I uh, got a call from my people. We're running out of meat, believe it or not. <laughs> and I said, guys, we have to take a time out. And they said, well, we're not done. They said, well, you got to take a ride with me. Um, you'll probably see the video or some audio of these two fine gentlemen having uh, carrying about 60 pounds of prime rib across Reading Terminal and fresh vegetables and what great sports and Great conversationalist and um, thoughtful young human beings. It's a joy. <laughs> and then he challenged me in ping pong. How'd that work out for you? I uh, I thought. I mean, I thought I I thought I held my own. No, no. What did you say before we started? I said me minus three and a half. How'd that work out? Yeah, I needed a couple of points. I needed <laughs> maybe another dozen or so. Lost by and eight, maybe nine. We'll have to check the film. We will check the film. But I'm pretty sure I'm going with twenty-one twelve. There's some 
Great video. Um, and it was a lot of fun. Thank you for indulging. Yeah. I'm a, Thank you. I read a, a meme earlier today. Um, my friend Matt, who you met in the elevator, um, sent me a meme. He said, why do 20-year-old women think that their men are going to mature? And the, the thought of the meme is guys mature by 12, and then they get to about 50 or 60, and then they regress because they never mature past 12. So I like to think that's a good thing. I was going to say, it's like, I mean, there's two ends to it. Yeah. Do you want to be mature? Sure. But I think as you mature, you also stop growing and you lose this childlike excitement, which you clearly have to still be, you know, are you 60 yet? 60 in six weeks. Okay. Okay. So July 1st. So coming up on 60 and you're still running around talking shit to kids, playing ping pong and socks, you know, like, but that keeps your energy alive. And that's, I mean, this was, I don't know how to like that. You're, you're a little wild. (laughs) I'm, 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 I think I started by saying I'm touched. Touched. I'm touched. touched. Um, but again, try to be friendly. You saw that. We talked yeah. to people in the Reading Terminal. We talked to people in the restaurant before we came up. Talked to people in our elevator on the way up. Um, you can just be kind and nice. And yeah, it's just crazy how your life will be better. Um, yeah. And uh, it should be better through cheesesteaks. <laughs> yeah, good call. So is there something that you, um, do you carry this energy in the courtroom? Mm-hmm. I do. Because I want to transition this to how, because I think, again, on the mental health side of things, this is one of the first things we ever talked about was like the things that you see. I I assume that all these things are mental health problems. And also just a little side point on mental health in general. I'm starting to try to like get away from the term because mental health is just health. The reason that people- No, that's, wow, that is the most accurate statement you said today. Mental health, and I'm going to stop you right there. Um, And we'll, I'm going to digress for a second. But it's to your point, and I don't want to forget it. And when you get to be my age, you tend to forget things. You'll see how that goes. You're like, I wanted to say that. And five minutes, like, what was I going to say? So I need to say this. So when I have someone who's dealing with, I'm still going to call mental health issues Mm. because it's health issues, but it's not a physical health. It's a mental health. So I'm okay with saying it. A lot of people with mental health issues don't believe they have mental health issues. They think they're the ones thinking clearly. And other people, a plethora of people, might see aberrant behavior. So I try to explain to them, even if, and they might have been diagnosed, or a lot of them do know that they have some issues, either with depression or anxiety, or even schizophrenia, even the schizophrenic do. Mm-hmm. And the difficulty is they don't like taking medications, because almost every medication has a side effect. It either causes them to be drowsy, they lose their sex drive, they don't feel like themselves, everyone will tell you that. And I don't mean to go on and drag on, but I, the next sentence is exactly what you're saying. I tell them that their mental health is not dissimilar to everybody else's health. And I point to my crier who doesn't mind me saying that he has diabetes. And I'm like, Bobby has diabetes. If he doesn't take his insulin or regulate his sugar, he's going to go blind or lose his feet or toes. If you had diabetes, would you take insulin and watch? And they're like, of course I would. And then I say, there's some people have high blood pressure. To stop from having heart attacks, they take medications. So they don't have a heart attack or stroke. If you had high blood pressure, yes. And generally speaking, people with mental health issues have a chemical imbalance of some sort. If I told you there's a medicine that will make the balance a little better and make you a little bit more rational, why wouldn't you take it? And that kind of point gets through, and I've given that speech thousands of times, and it's worked a great majority. And I say, and here's the caveat, you're going to feel better. But when you feel better, you don't stop taking it. That's the other thing about mental health issues. When they feel better, they stop taking because they feel better and right. And I said, well, when you have diabetes or high blood pressure, you don't stop taking it because you feel good. Yeah. You make sure you take it in the morning so you feel good the next day. You can't go off your medications. So Mental health and physical health are identical. Just one involves the brain, one your heart, one your liver, one your toes, one your insulin. So it's there should not be a stigma on mental health. Yeah. And we have created a stigma when none should exist because it is just your health. And there are medications that help people along. And a lot of people, and I'll let you make your next point, a lot of people self-medicate when they have mental health issues. And they'll use cocaine or PCP or Adderall to compensate for their not feeling right. And then that creates more issues. Yeah. They're just trying to feel something. And that's, and this is part of, I talk about it all the time. This is part of my medication, essentially my natural medication. Like this is therapy for me. 
this is again that like supplies that human connection that deeper level that i need to like be happy but i say that mental health is just health because and i'm learning this as i go and grow and develop we're acting into, like mature adults now. Is there, anybody going to yeah. stay listening? After, after, Are they going to continue yeah. to listen like in a serious after, after Chris the and Scott hour. conversation? <laughs> after the ping pong game. But um, yeah. I think mental health is just a, again, and we want to call it mental health now, which again, like we brand this as a destigmatized, destigmatizing men's mental health, which is what we want to do. And I had a friend over here last night, my boy, Zach, he said, because I was talking about the issue that I'm having where it's like, yes, it's a mental health podcast, but we don't, we're not going to just talk about depression and anxiety and mental health at all every second, because I just want to create the space where people can open up about again, who they are. And my friend said like half the mental health problem with men is they just need to talk to each other. And like, well, that's well, all I want to do. Here. So now, <laughs> again, you, you, you must read my mind or you're a mini me and I'm sorry, <laughs> you probably need. I've got something too, going too on. Sh- so men don't like seeking help. Before your day, before Google Maps and you know Wayfair, Wayfinder, you had to ask for directions. I don't know if you, you probably don't remember this, but your father would. You had to stop at gas stations for directions. We all carried a map in the pouch behind the seat of our car. Um, everybody did, and most men would not stop for directions. They would lose. They would drive around for an hour. Uh, I'll never <laughs> forget my mom telling my dad, "Just stop in the gas. I'll find it. I remember it's the right turn here." Men don't like seeking help. They don't want help. They want to be independent. They want to be strong. It's what society has done to us. Women are more in touch with themselves. They're more apt to seek um, resolutions and grow. Men are lazy and like where we are. And we don't seek change. And we certainly don't ask for help. So men with mental health issues or any... How about just issues? How about we, don't call them? Yeah. we all have issues. Yeah. And by the way, I tell the people... In my courtroom, like, we're all, like, we all have problems, fights with our wife, don't get along with our mother-in-law, get depressed, think of our mom, have our dogs die. It's normal to have a range of emotions. It's how you deal with them and the consequences from those actions. Don't recede into a dark room. Talk to somebody. Talk to a friend. Call your mother. Call your best friend. And your, whoever your best family friend, call for 15 minutes. Get out of the whole, the blackness, the depression, just speaking to one person might spare you to have more energy and not wallow in the issue that you're having. Yeah. And it helps both parties. Cause there's, I, I've, I have a close friend that I uh, lean on heavily for. Not Max. <laughs> Max too. But I have a friend that I, um, he's a little bit, he's probably in like his forties and uh, old. He's, he's helped, you know, he's helped me out a lot with just emotional relationship type stuff. Like just like, again, like having that guy. To, I'm here for you to go way. to. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm in and I'll the be second here floor somewhere. I, yeah, that's, that's no, right. I'm the older guy who doesn't ask for help. Yeah. <laughs> I just give advice and help. And don't take it. I like to think I don't need it much right now, but I'm sure I do. Yeah. Again, we don't <laughs> ask for help. Yeah. We'll unpack, I, we'll unpack that in a little bit. Well, a good, <laughs> let me, I'm on the couch already. Yeah. I just put the pillow down there and. <laughs> yeah. Go from there. Exactly. No holes in my socks, right? Um, no, no, okay, you're good. good. You're good. But uh, <laughs> but so the story is that like usually I'm leaning on him, and and for this this week he called me and he was he was struggling, and I we went for a walk and I said, hey, what's up? We haven't seen each other in a couple of months. And first thing he said, uh, you know, I was like, how are you doing? He goes, I'm not good. It hasn't been good. And I was just so happy that we're at a point in that, in that friendship. And then also like what we're trying to do here and what like the energy I'm trying to create to say, like, look, if you're not, if shit's not good, say it because we've hit it for so long. And that's, so I'm going to give you another story because I love to talk. Yes. I believe in karma and being good in life. And I think things come around. So it's directly regarding mental health. I won't use her name. I'll use one of her initials L. She was a friend and a colleague in the DA's office who, um, had a very tough go. I think she was orphaned and I think she was raised at the Hershey School. Obviously, you have issues if you have to be raised as an orphan. Sweet, beautiful, intelligent, hardworking. Became a lawyer, became a DA, became a chief of a unit, and had a boyfriend who um, manipulated her in some fashion. Whenever you've been abandoned or might have issues, guys can take advantage of you in certain ways. And he did, and she did something she shouldn't have done. It was entirely stupid a car and she abused her power in like one tenth of one percent in my opinion but it caused her to lose her job so she went from like a chief of a major unit to unemployed 
and lost her license to practice law over something that should have been probation, but I won't get into it. She mm -hmm. abused power by having a detective put a car in stolen status and take it out. No harm, no, like ridiculous amount of punishment. And she got very depressed. And I was not very good friends with her, but I was friendly like I am with most people. And I knew she had a house and a son. So I offered her to be, when I was a lawyer before being a judge, I said, well, it'd be a paralegal. I can't pay a lot of money because we all have debts and children and car payments. But I can pay you 25 an hour. You work 20 hours, 500 a week, 2,000. At least you can pay your mortgage and not lose your house until you get on your feet. She had told me that she had some very dark thoughts. I'll leave it that way. Yeah. Very. And credits me with. Helping her out. In a lot of ways, like still being here. Yeah. And um, so when it came time for me to pull a number to be a judge. So there's an election, 72 people wanted to be a judge. Where you are in the ballot is paramount. If you're number one, you win. You're number 72. I don't care if you're John F. Kennedy, you won't win. People can't find you in a morass of names. Go up to Harrisburg and pull my number for me. I'm on trial. What number do you think she picked out of one to 100? One. Number one, that's why I'm a judge. <laughs> she picked number one. The room gasped, and I'm like, I guess I'll be a judge now. And that's when I left a very lucrative criminal practice, very lucrative, did I leave that out? And I said, I'm gonna help people. And um, she went and picked my number. She was picked especially for that. And so that was intentional? Intentional. I did her, and we were friends. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about a year and a half later now. Yeah. Got back on her feet. So now she picks number one, and this is the craziest story ever. She then, we have to get signatures to be on the ballot. You need a thousand, we get 2,000. So Lynn, L is um, getting me signatures at the supermarket and a guy comes up, they make a connection. He's a preacher, they're married now. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. So just being a, me being a good person, her being a great person. Yeah. And it all Karma comes back. intervening. I can tell you 10 or 20 of those stories, so. And that's the thing, I just think that the people are on our on our path for a reason, and you don't know why. Like, and again, even with this situation, we've had way too many situations where we've just, the right people at the right time for the right reason, for whatever, and I, and I don't understand it, and I've tried to, something I'm working on in my own personal, and this life as well, is like just getting the fuck out of my own way. Yeah. Sorry, but like I. Uh, people get in their own head, yeah, yeah. and then they dwell on it. You I stop have a friend yourself. who just like is on the internet. She's like a neural infection. She'll research everything. It's always the worst yeah. thing. Everything's of the mind, and that that um, you know, people stop themselves from success, and that's like my you know whole thing. I won't kind of get into that, but um, back to the uh, the mental health, the things that you see. Like what I was trying to say is that physical health, spiritual health, intellectual health relationship health social health like all of these aspects and right now we just want to call it mental health but the truth is is like our health in general is terrible as like a society well there's every every study will tell you that if you're active and you're in a good place you'll live longer yeah i yeah. mean like colorado go to people who have a good outlook on life live longer anxiety and stress are the biggest killers they create physical ailments and bad health and we should work on it more we sh and we should i've never heard anybody say what you just said and it's you're way wise but beyond your years there are all different aspects of your life all of which we can improve on i try to improve on relationship health with my wife not being sure not being condescending we have an age gap so i'm often condescending i'm also dismissive too often I'm aware of it, so 90% of the time I'm great about it, but there's 10%, and I wish it's 99-1 instead of 90-10. So relationship health is important, because then if you spend time with somebody, it uh, makes both of your lives easier. And we have a child, so yeah. she's the happiest child on the planet, I hope, I think. <laughs> um, and work health, I mean, I don't know if that was one of yours. Yeah, you know, yeah. Work-life balance, he has a sister who works. I texted my buddy yesterday, I go, again, back into this, this routine, and um, it's started two weeks ago and I've had my best two weeks of work since. And I texted my buddy last night. I was like, it's so ridiculous how much this impacts the rest of my life because I'm just like not as stressed because things are going well. And as we were talking about in Reading Terminal Market, like we want to be the best at everything. And I, you know, for the past six months, but I started this new job. There's not going to be any depression about the ping pong loss, right? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm going to get you though. I'm You're gonna, never going to get you know, me. You, I'm going to be trading. I, I have a, a a text chain of all you guys. I'm going to add you to the text chain with the other 10 guys. They're going to laugh, say, you're not going to get them. 
I will. Some I will. Really you, were, good I mean, athletes. you didn't have you didn't have sh- shoes on, so I, I, I kind of knew. On. I had and a, know what else I don't a, have a on? Up. Glasses. I don't have my glasses. I don't have, or shoes I didn't, on. I don't have my glasses I'm, on either. I didn't say anything though. Yeah, but I'm 60. You're 28. Okay. Six year old eyes and 28 year old eyes. So I played <laughs> in my socks, sliding around like I'm doing um, the Macarena. No glasses, and I get better with my second and third game. I'm 60. It takes a game or two. That's true. I, and you had the light coming in from outside. No, no yeah. light. It was the sh- but you have to deal with the shine off my head, so it, it's equal. <laughs> yeah. I love um, it. Getting back to mental health, humor is also pretty important. Yes, and that's again, that's the whole like what I was trying to say, and it. Um, I think before I cut you off, I think I, I think too much about everything, but. If you just beat people over the head with something, they're not going to be interested. So, like, I want stuff to be in here. I want stuff to be light. Like, there's a ton of like mental health and trauma based podcasts where it's like, I don't want to listen to that on a Monday. I'm sorry. I don't want to be depressed. I don't want to hear about like, again, for three straight hours, all the bad stuff. Like, I want to try to, you know, present this. Like, look, now, we all what, go through what's shit. What's the goal of this program? To do what? To alert? To ask people to don't be shy to ask for help? Talk to a friend? What's the goal just, of this podcast? We always say destigmatize the conversation. And what I want to do is just to allow people to live in their truth. Who are you? Why are you? Why are you the way that you are? Like my personal. So they have better lives. So that we all have better lives. But, but I'm saying this yeah. podcast is to get to people that some some of what we say today yeah. will get in your consciousness, and they have better lives, and we all have better lives. Yes, even yourself, because this is yes. probably somewhat therapeutic for yourself. E- extremely helpful yeah. and fun. Yeah, yeah, and productive. I, maybe some point uh, financially helpful. I know you got your first sponsor. We got to get you more. Yeah. <laughs> when Shays is up and running and has more money, I can promise you we're going to do something together. We're going to have. I promise you. I Just like I promised you, I'm giving you a whoop down and <laughs> ping pong every single time we play. I also promise when we're able to, we're going to do something. Well, together. thank you. I appreciate it. And, um, but yeah, so. so and do you also, have any mental health issues in your family? Why why are you so interested in uh, mental health? So I have, I have been diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. I, okay. You know. An I, event that occurred in your life? Yes. Yeah. You, yeah. you talk about it on your podcast? Series of events. I, I mentioned it a little bit. I haven't told my, my full story and I, I might not for, for a little while. This might, okay. not, this might not be the, not, um, today's not the day. Yeah. Today's not the day, but you'll work, but open but up. I'll come when you open up. Yeah. And my, and my, and my point is to, cause again, I don't think you need to go through the mud. Pu- I don't think pu- you have to publicly. You just either. have to have the public yeah. know that you're going to work on yourself and you're going to be the best version of yourself. And there's ways to get that done. For you, yeah. it's meditation, taking a nice walk before work. For others, it might be swimming or talking yeah. to a therapist or playing basketball or losing in ping pong. Yeah. And I just hope for this to be one of those things in your belt of tools that it's like entertaining, it's fun, it's light. It also shows that like you can talk about these things in a non depressing way. Cause like that's like, so yeah, so so A, that's my interest. And and B, I went through this really interesting path with therapy and getting help where I canceled my first three therapy appointments, four therapy appointments. How long ago? Uh now like twenty uh now like six, seven years ago. Um, because I thought if I go to therapy, people are gonna think I'm crazy. Do so you go to therapy? No? Yeah, 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 yeah. I go so you I, still I just go once a month now and I'm it's going okay. less and less. Yeah, oh it's great. I mean I You have somebody to talk to. Yeah, and it, at this point it's it's a different kind of therapy. It's it's almost more just like um making less, sure you're thinking clearly, telling people yeah, what and, um, and honestly more just like checking base with myself. Like it's a mirror. Like therapy is whatever you want it to be if you have a good therapist. And this is another thing that I've learned is that I'm insanely fortunate to have my therapist, like her specifically. Some people go and have a therapist that they don't like, they don't get along with, they don't, you know. Time to move on and get one that you can relate yeah, to and yeah. can relate to you. And I just happen to, <coughs> happen to, you. just happen to have one that works extremely well. Excellent. Um, but I started out going, going once a week. And the whole thing is, is that I canceled my first couple appointments. And then I read Kevin Love's article in the Tr- Players' Tribune. Kevin loved the athlete? Basketball player, yeah. So you wanna, should we call Kevin for you? That's, I mean, he's the dream guest. He's number one. Let me call. My first. Um, <laughs> so my, one of my best friends from the DA's office, Sam Goldfeder, is a sports agent. We work together in the DA's office. We remain close friends. He is Kevin Love's agent. <laughs> um, let's call Sam on the air and see if he'll pick up the phone. <laughs> and there's nothing like doing something immediately. And if he looked up, Sam Goldfeder right now on NBA agents. You reach Sam, leave <laughs> a message and I'll call you back. At the tone, please record your message. When you finish recording, you may hang up or press one for more options. 
Brother Sam and Scotty, give me a call when you can. It's reasonably important, and I love you. So Sam, I have a great story about Sam. We're just going to digress because we're going to have fun. So Sam and I and a certain Supreme Court justice, Pennsylvania Supreme Court justice presently, worked in Jay's office 1989. And Sam and I were good friends. He's from New York. We talk basketball all the time. And uh, when he broke my balls, he called me Dick Claudio. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, it was fun and all. So one day I go to my friend's pharmacy. He owns a pharmacy. And I said, what's the strongest prescription strength laxative you have? And that's pill form. And laxatives are for people who can't move their bills. I take five of them and I crush them up. Five. <laughs> and I put it in a Gatorade bottle. And it's orange Gatorade. You can check me. 1989, I think they just came out with orange Gatorade. And I crush it up and Sam comes by my desk. And I say, Sam, I'm not digging this orange Gatorade. Do you want it? <laughs> so Sam drinks the orange Gatorade. And... Um, gets in the elevator with the Supreme Court justice, and they share the Gatorade. Thank God for me. Because had they not shared it, Sam would have probably been in the hospital. By the time they got from 12 to 1, they had to run to the Purple Orchid to go to the bathroom. They each lost seven pounds. If they got to the bathroom, oh, I got to go again. They thought they <laughs> ate bad food until I told them. And Sam and I have been best friends ever since. Ever since. For 30s. Into 35 years. He left the DA's office, worked here locally, and then went to become probably the biggest sports agent in California. Damn. He works, his partner is Schwartz. He's the number one basketball agent. He has about 600 million under management. Sam has about 400 million. So they have, they have Joe Kick. Joe Kick's oh, one yeah? of the client. Um, they're the guard from that. They have like six nuggets. That's incredible. When, when Miami played Denver, they had 12 guys on each team. So Sam, is really good friends with Kevin Love, and we will see if we can get you in touch with him. And then your podcast really gets nutty. That, <laughs> I was going to say, I, I talked about it in the first, in the introduction of our first episode. I did like a four minute, um, just talking to the camera about why I was starting the podcast and what it's all going to be about. And I said, like, when I read that article, I was like, all right, well, if he, if he can open up about his shit, like, I, maybe I can go get it's this help that I told I you about, I helped someone, they picked my number, was number one. Yeah. We met in an elevator, we had a good conversation, and my friend, one, my best friend, one of my best friends is his agent, and they're really good yeah, it's like, So how weird would that be if we get Kevin Love to come on for 15 minutes one day? And that's the thing. That's the thing. It's like I, he, he has a whole, and that's, he's still t talking about it. Like he, he has got a whole company, I, a whole we, fund. I wanted him to come to the Sixers because if you're, if you're so a sports fan, he it was between us and them. Sam actually, if you, you're a basketball fan? Yes, yeah, yeah. So you know, you, know who, fan. you know who Mikel Bridges is? Yeah, yeah. Mikel Bridges, local Philly guy. Great value. Sam's his agent. He got drafted by the Sixers. And yeah. They traded him on draft day. We're still pissed we don't have Mikel Bridges. That was a tough team. go, yeah. So Mikel comes to the four seasons. Sam was nice enough to call him. We got pictures with Remy, me, and Mikel. Oh, nice. He'll be in this year to eat some cheese sticks. That's Shay Steaks. Shea Steaks. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're just going to. Um, we'll every once in a while, I'll throw that out there just for fun. Just a I'm, little, it's a just a little. joke. Just a joke. Um, but, but you're, I mean, that's it's going to happen. That I, I was just looking at the Instagram when we stopped. You got some people coming in. Um, um, I saw Gargano. Hey, Gargano, yeah, shout us out to like a hundred thousand. Um, yeah, we have we have the wrestlers really love us. We have a band called the Red Clay Strays. Um, they they you know what? It's such a small world, and I don't understand it. Um, and I'm gonna have to get into one more thing and dig keep digressing after Sam's client list comes up, which is Kevin Love is his first person. Damn. Anyway, um, the Red Clay Strays came in with Chase. And I didn't recognize them. I, it's know, a band. It's a band. Um, I didn't recognize them. They, they look like a band. Yeah. <laughs> and then their manager said, you know, they're the right clay strays. I'm like, sorry, I'm not a country band. And then they looked, and there's 105 million views of their song, One Year Am I, and a song that I love, Good Godly Woman, has like 20 million views. And we took pictures with Remy and them, and then they posted our stuff, and just good guys. And it just so happens. The world is so small, and God is great, and I'm not the most religious guy. They just put out a song in the new album, Drops Today, about mental health and depression. No way. It drops Are they Philly today. guys? No, they're from South Alabama. They, they're opening for, so my, and this is just crazy in my life. My daughter, Remy, has one, she, she run around all day in a Rolling Stones t-shirt. If you look on my Instagram, you'll see the lead singer um, where, holding my daughter. She's wearing Rolling Stones. Do you know who the Red Clay Strays open for this summer? The Stones? The Stones. <laughs> That's wild. And they're releasing a song today about mental health. 
She's wearing, just so happens the day they come into my store and I meet them, she's wearing the Stone shirt. And that's how I knew they were a band. They're like, we open for the Stones. That's incredible. And their music's incredible. My wife says that I have a, a boy crush or a man crush on the lead singer. He's just amazing voice. That's awesome. There's, amazing that's voice. the thing is there's so many. And I, I haven't been the most religious person. I've started to lean into it more and more heavily as like, I mean, I've prayed throughout this entire Oh, journey. excuse me one second. Yeah, yeah no worries. Call back. Sorry. Brother Sam, I'm in the middle of a podcast. I just dropped your okay. name. It's a, he has about a thousand followers, um, but he brings up a name and his inspiration for starting this podcast, and it's his 20th, is Kevin Love. Okay. I said, my friend Sam, uh, so um, if, you, if Kevin's ever in Center City, you got to okay. get me to cheesesteak and meet my friend. Because my man's starting a career because of Kevin's openness. And I told him the story about um, a certain um, Gatorade <laughs> um, and he, he's a sports he's a Knicks fan you probably loving okay. life these days right Sam yeah well we'll see Sunday what do you think they win or lose I think they win Brunson's is Brunson like he's insane right yeah he's unbelievable I mean how did he's doing it by himself too we're digressing <laughs> but he's doing it without Randall um, yeah. OC's barely playing they lost the guy off the yeah. bench like he's yeah. I thought the Sixers were going to beat him because I mean, how can you play 40 minutes a game and continue to be successful? Yeah, well, that's that's Tibbs, though. That's his Tibbs is that good, huh? Well, no, it's just that he, he plays guys 40 minutes. That's just his MO. Right. Um, do you, Bye, bro. Bob. <laughs> you will meet. You that's will meet, crazy. You don't know Sam. You will meet Kevin Lowe. That's all. I'd love year. to have Sam on, too. I'd love to talk about that kind of. Uh, I mean, that's an interesting life being oh, an agent. Sam, he moved out. He lives in Beverly Hills. That's awesome. Does he get out here at all? Not often. Awesome. We, um, he's, I, so Jeff Schwartz is the number one basketball agent in the world. He's XL Sports, which is New York based. Sam is their LA based um, rep for all those guys. Interesting. Interesting. I was just looking at the, uh, the Look, I cut off the, or the audio cut off. I had to delete something real quick, but we're, we're good. Um, right. Well, thanks for doing that. That's so wild. Like, again, like this is. No, no. He, we will. You make sure I have all your numbers. Yeah, yeah. When Kevin, if Kevin loves in the league next year and he comes to Philly, he will come and shake. They stay at the Four Seasons, two and a half blocks away. Yeah, yeah. And I that's guarantee like, Sam will call him and say, and that's Sam's part been of, his agent for 10 years. That's part of the thing. We'll, we'll have to send him the, the clip and video um, from the first episode. Please. You know where I said it. Like, Wait, hey, please. This, yes, yeah, yeah. I'll get to Sam. Sam will get to him tonight. Yeah, yeah. Because that's, um, cause it, it, again, that's the whole thing. If I can just be that for one other person, like I, part of what I want to say to Kevin directly is like i don't does he realize how many lives he saved like that's not a joke like that's that's the impact that he's made has shifted the conversation so drastically it's incredible and he was the first one to do it like now it's it's I almost like popular. Him and tell him to tell him that today <laughs> that was very poignant and very sweet and we'll have we'll have it too but. Buddy. One last sentence. He seemed to call me Snyder. I got more Gatorade for you. Keep it the fuck up. <laughs> so, the, so um, the young man on the podcast just finished. He's like, does Kevin know how important his message is, how many lives yes. he saved, and how important what he's doing is for our he population? Does. So just tell him that this young man is touched. His uh -huh. voice was cracking when he was saying it. I'll send you the yeah. clip. But please reach okay. out to Kevin and tell him that we're just having like a – a, a very, very, very poignant moment here in Philadelphia, and it's because awesome. of him. I will. I will. Bye, Sammy. Thank Thanks you. for letting me know. Yep. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> it's such a small world. It's like <laughs> I wouldn't doubt that Kevin he reaches out to you by the end of uh, the day. I, I I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to say. I um. I thank well you. worth that that ping pong beating you took. <laughs> yeah, I'm never gonna hear the end of that. No. Nope. But it's incredible. And like, that's, um, you familiar with Mark Jackson, Sixers pregame, pregame live? A little bit. So, so he was, he, he was on our ninth episode and he came in and told, told his whole story and, and same thing where it's like, we Temple talked, we, we talked, yeah, we talked about Kevin Love and, um, again, the impact and, and Mark, you know, puts, puts his message out there and, and helps, helps the cause as well. Um, but yeah, so I just want to be a little, uh, you know, a tiny, as of right now, a tiny fraction of that, but I want that to, to keep going. Um, and while this won't stay a mental health podcast forever, we'll always talk about it. Why not? Um, cause it, it needs to be talked about, but I do want to ask to, um, to hear more of your, again, in your day to day, the mental health 
as you're saying, the issues, what is it that is the common thread and what has changed over the past 20 years? Because it's gotten worse. The suicide, you know, the suicide rate. Um, yeah, I have a drug, very strong drug, opinion on that. Drug you know, addictions. Um, as I'm done scrolling, I will tell you what a small world it is. Um, who would that be? Yeah, <laughs> Big Mark, Big Mark Jackson. Man, he's that the, was about two months ago. He's one of the freshest guys in Philly. He dresses great. Um, anyway, oh, Tyrese, he's yeah, a dream guest Tyrese, too. He used to live in the building. In here? Yeah, him and Paul Reed. Paul Reed just moved out. That's crazy. I Paul Reed still uses the gym. I don't, I, I don't know. I, that's wild. So let's get back to your question. Um, we failed as a society. Um, I talk about this in court daily. Talked about it Thursday. We have not spent enough time, money, or resources dealing with people who have what you don't like to call mental health issues. The people sleeping on grates, the homeless, most homeless are mentally ill. Yeah, yeah. And um, there's mental illness and mental health, which are two different no, things. Well, which... let's talk about both. Um, mental illness we've is a form of mental health. It's just the most severe of the conditions. And we've just neglected them. We have them on every street corner and we just, police and us as professionals just walk by them and hope that they don't interfere with our daily lives. I think we have more of a responsibility than that, don't we? Um, we don't afford enough money. Um, we shouldn't be paying a billion dollars for a stadium. We should build um, somewhere where we have land. Soros shouldn't spend billions on getting people elected. He should spend billions on building facilities and paying doctors and paying for medications for people with mental illness. As far as mental health, um, I don't know we've done less. I I'm going to disagree with you. I think the message and the awareness and the PDAs that people do, like Kevin Love and yourself, have brought it more to the forefront so there's no stigmatism and you can get treatment and there's suicide hotlines and things of that nature. So... I don't know. We've regressed as much. I think we've. I don't, actually, I don't mean in the in the. We've regressed. I just mean statistically. Well, statistically is only because there's statistics. Yeah. And yeah. there's more. Because we're doing of it. We're doing more. There's more resources. So than there's ever. more people who died. We just didn't know how they died. There's there's the internet. There, we know what happens in Toledo. Yeah, that's uh, a good there's point. There's been that's a good so. Point. I, I would think the numbers are the same. Just the causes are now more identifiable than 30 years ago. People. Um, got hit by a train. They wrote they got hit by a train, not that they jumped in front of the train. A lot of people hit it. Um, I would think that suicides numerically probably have, and we have more population, so there's more raw people dying. You're right. And it's more people are getting identified of it. Um, I would hope, and it just makes sense, that because we were so out there with the mental health message, get help, suicide hotlines, friends, and healthcare, I think it's probably less. I just, I hate to disagree that's a good, with you. No, that's a good point. That statistically, it's like uh, Nassim Taleb always talks about numbers. You know, the it's way how you report stuff. And I don't, yeah. I'm not a COVID denier. COVID was horrible. We should have worn masks. I don't know why Trump couldn't have said, "Hey, uh, I might not believe in it, but wear a mask for grandma or wear a mask for the mental health of the person next to you." Yeah, there's no real inconvenience to wearing a mask. So with COVID, I don't know if you know this, there used to be like a hundred thousand people died every year of flu. The years of COVID, like 1,000 people died. Yeah. They were all COVID. Um, so it's how you report. It's how the, you want to play with the numbers. Yeah. Um, and, you, and you made I, a good point that the, there's, we just have more people than ever. So like the, of course, the, the raw numbers, but is it the percentage? Is the percentage they probably going say on? the percentage, but again, it's how they report the percentages. Yeah. Other police chiefs, you can play with violent crime. Yeah. Any data can be manipulated to for the purpose of wanting the story. That's a good point. I would just think... I would hope that we have made an effort to get people in a better place. And I would think that that would actually have an effect. And maybe that's the optimist in me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I agree. And I think, and again, with the, the drug addiction, the, um, all these things are again, mental health. I just, I, and I, the, the mental health term is, is the correct term, but it's, it's, I just think it's, a more you just holistic. don't like it. No, I just don't. What would you call the health of your brain health? It's got brain health. I mean, the NBA calls it mind health. Mind I, health. I like mind so, health. I, I mean, mental health, it's just. It's a state of mind it's health. Almost, well, the thing is, is that, and this happens, this is just natural. This happens with everything. Is that like, 
you know, it's like now we want to blame everything on our mental health. Well, it's like, all right, well, it's not your mental health. You're, you're 75 pounds overweight. You're well, physically, you're physically, and like, again, like I, like picking apart everything, there's trauma. So are, living in your are body. you 75 pounds overweight because you're depressed? Exactly. And that's my point is like, like let's attack cause. it. Yes. Yes. Let's and that's why I do in court. Yes. Why do you, why are you in front of me? And the, because you're yeah. using drugs because you, you're not taking your medication. You're not addressing yes. the issues which cause you to make bad decisions. And the, th and my belief is the reason, the reason is, and even with the physical health things, there's traumatic experiences that we don't talk about that nobody wants to accept. Nobody wants to acknowledge in their own mind and in their own brain, body, everything. And when you hide those things, again, that's why I talk about things. It's why I write things. It's why I see a therapist. It's why I, again, and like, I haven't publicly opened up about stuff with my friends and everybody. It's not, it's not necessary to do. Yeah. You just have to say that but I you gotta have gone get through similar issues. What this specific issue is yeah. unimportant. Exactly. You, you, have to, exactly. you have traumatic issues in your life, whether it's physical, mental death, um, and everybody abuse, goes dogs, whatever it is, it's of no consequence how you got to where you are Presently, it's how you're going to put yourself in a better position tomorrow mm -hmm. by meditating, taking a walk, by swimming, by reading, by doing community service. Uh, endorphins help you get rid of negative thoughts. And once you start having, my ex-wife has a slogan, make, she told me, she probably, I had broken up with a girlfriend and COVID, she said, make your own luck. Make your own luck. Yeah. Do things that will put you in a better position to be happy later. Just don't complain about it. Go do something. Make your own luck. Make efforts to meditate, walk, get a new job, reach out to people, do community service, play in a soccer league, play pinball, communicate um, with, we used to have when I was a kid um, in other countries, be a pen pal, do something. Mm -hmm. Be kind today for no reason. Make your own luck. Yeah. And it's, and it's a mindset shift, the entire thing. Like I, the way that I look at it, and again, this is why I want to, you know, share, talk about it and have other people like. Did you I, get me on because you knew I was touched? <laughs> I had, yeah, I, yes, yes. There, I knew there was something. I knew that there was a lot more than what uh, the eye would see in three minutes being in the shop. I think that there was, there was just so clearly a something that was bigger than you and your, like, again, that's my thing. But again, I can't send, like, I have these, what I, and again, like you're saying, I, I have these like six senses that I wouldn't have if I didn't have that traumatic past. I wouldn't be able to do this today if I didn't go through all that hell. Well, that's and, why I think I'm a good judge because I grew up humble. I experienced life and I wasn't born into with a silver spoon, is that what it's called, mm -hmm. or a navy tower. You experience life, you experiment people seeing tragedy and conflict and how things affect people and only your past experiences enable you to be good at what you're doing. Um, you can't be great at washing windows if you've never washed a window. You can't be great at having a mental health show if you didn't have some issues in your past, either you dealt with or had a family member. You can't be a good judge if you don't have the human life experiences. So that's why we need you here. We need you to grow big and strong, both mentally and within the show, so you can promote Shay's. Shay's Steaks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just, we're just going to continue that bit on all of the next episodes, just randomly. I might just knock on the door and yell, Shay's Steaks. Yeah. We could get a banner flying out here. Well, you know, from my apartment, we hang a banner down. I can get one yeah. to come up somehow. We'll, 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 well make it's it not happen. far from the roof. I can figure out where the roof is compared to your apartment and throw like a fishing line over the side and you see Shay's Steaks thing. Don't put that past me. I like it. That may happen. We'll make it happen. Um, some of the last questions on on just being a judge. One of the things, as you're saying that about everybody's life and that you've just experienced life, are you like unsurprised when you, when somebody comes in? Because are you seeing a, you're seeing a person who's clearly gone wrong in some aspect of life? If, you know, as far as the legal system goes. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm past the surprise stuff. I think I've I mean I do tens of thousands of cases as a judge in a year. It's going to sound like. People are always exaggerating, but if they knew what I did as a judge, yeah. I've done hundreds of thousands of cases um, just because of my position within the system. So nothing surprises me. Um, some things make me wonder, like, how can that possibly happen? I had a, a guy in this week who had mental health issues, and his mother and his aunt came in. You need to take him off the street. He needs help. And after I dug a little deeper, he was obviously... The family situation is fractured beyond any semblance of any 
reconciliation. Not, not a semblance. I mean, they could have fought in the courtroom had I had not strong grip and control of my courtroom. And they wanted them 302'd. I'm like, why? He seems respectful to me. And what's 302's three, oh, three the uh, hospital? In, in, involuntary commitment. And their reason was he's disrespectful. I'm like, if I put everybody on as disrespectful, <laughs> I'm like, that's not what the system is set up to do. And then he blurts out, because I'm like, I was agreeing with him. I was not going to put him away, but I'm also making him go to his doctor and order him to go and take the medication, which was the next day. And he understood. I'm like, you have to go, because if you're not treating yourself, you're going to act irrationally and maybe help hurt someone else. So I'm going to try to help you. And while I'm helping you, I'm helping others. And they just went away. And they're like, he blurts out, and like, what do you think, another whooping's going to do me good? And there's really no, and I asked my staff after, he was whooped with chains or belts or something yeah. that really formed him. And he wants nothing to do with his family. And they want him put away. You can just tell. And that was a very difficult dynamic. Because they want him put away. I, he, he was respectful. But you can tell he wasn't thinking 100% clearly. And he lives with their mother, grandma, And I know they're going to go, and the, he can't live there. And I'm like, well, that's your mother's decision, not your decision. And how, how old is this guy? 40. So do you... Do you blame him? Do you like, I, see, like again? I, we're holding these people responsible for things that, and again, I, I I go back and forth, and there's there's again the whole thing. This is my whole thing about everything now is like there's nuance to every single situation, oh, and that's your job. It's more than nuance. I mean, what's deeper? And there's it's like that marbling in that prime rib at Shea Steaks. <laughs> um, it, it, there, there are so many permutations and factors that go into someone's health, me, mental or physical. And there's no doubt that, and we talked about this as my staff afterward, that a lot of his anxiety, depression, acting out, um, there was no doubt the way he brought it out that they used to whoop him. Yeah. And not with their hands. And I'm sure that he has those scars. And that's why I'm going to a doctor and making sure. I said, I don't need you to be best friends, but I need you to talk about what happened and how you're going to get through this for the rest of your life because you're 40. Yeah. So and that's yeah, the thing. That, that was Thursday. And that's like, and again, part of what I wanted to, um, and this is what I wanted. If I would ever let you get to a point, um, we'd <laughs> yeah, we, we get no, some of your, your concepts. Great. I, I just am interested in everybody. Like, again, like I said earlier, that's what you deal with in your day, day to day. And then you go home and you make dinner and like, you go be with your family and you, and like these, that you're dealing with like murder cases, criminals. Uh, like, and so, so I'm actually doing something. I've never even told you this. So I'm in my ninth year. So my first five years, I ran what's called the smart room, um, which was we tried to resolve cases before they had to go to trial. Remember I told you I was a moderate, pretty well balanced? Mm -hmm. That was my job. When I started, there were six divisions within the city, East Division, Northeast, Northwest, Center City, South Philadelphia, Southwest. And we had a judge in each division. And every time you got arrested, in geographical area, center city, whatever the parameters would be, you would go to that judge after the preliminary hearing. When I took over, my new boss said, which one do you want to do? And I'm like, I'll take those four. He was like, no, no, each judge gets one. I'm like, and I'll take those four. <laughs> and I did the busiest, which was East two days, center city one day, Northwest, the second business one day, and IP program, drug program. And I did that for five years. We had two of everything. We worked hard. That's why I, I really I did about 50 cases a week to disposition or 3,000 a year, which is about 2,500 more a year than any other judge in the Commonwealth. Damn. So I have all those people under my supervision, like 15,000. And then they asked me to do what's called post-conviction relief or the homicide stuff where we, I can look back. And again, I know they were kind enough to give me this responsibility. Anybody who's been unjustly convicted in the last 51 years can ask for what's called post-conviction relief. After your conviction, something has occurred that causes us to relook at it, whether it's new DNA evidence, we find out a detective was a liar, a witness was a liar, um, new evidence in any respect, new video uncovered. It's called post-conviction. And I have the ability and the authority to undo a conviction from a judge's verdict or a jury's verdict and whatever sentence that was imposed. So if I thought it was just and fair, I can vacate a, set, a verdict and vacate a sentence. Um, this year I let somebody out after 51 years. 
just last week after 37 years where we found out that the arts and evidence might not be as obvious as was testified to 37 years ago because of new advances in technology. They had thought it was an arson murder, but it turns out, it, and they did burden patterns primarily back then. Turns out with new evidence, I had a set of experts, even the Commonwealth said, this might not have been an arson. So I said that the jury may have reached a different conclusion had they had this set of forensic evidence and I let them out after 37 years. So I'm in charge of all of those cases all post-conviction relief from all the judges over the last 50 years. And most of them are homicides, mostly all of them. And I can take people off death row, let them out of jail, kept them in jail, mostly kept them in jail. How do you cope with that power? I'm very humble. <laughs> Not so much. Um, <laughs> but like, do you um, think about it? Like, like when, when you're saying that, I'm like... We talked about never being perfect, never one being wrong, striving to be great. I take my time with every case. I read every word and I hope I get everyone right. Pray to God I get them all right. But I use my 35 years of experience, um, intellect, experience, law clerks, read, care, to make a decision that's well-informed each and every time. I hope I got everyone right. I'm sure I can't get everyone right. But I make judgment calls, use my experience. Um, sometimes it's as simple as, I've been in jail 30 years and this guy now says that he was at the scene and I didn't do it, really. It just came forward 30 years later. Well, yeah, we just happened to be cellmates and he's my cousin. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, get out. Yeah, you stay yeah. in jail. I'm not changing a verdict from 30 years ago because your celly just came forward 30 years later and yeah. said it wasn't you. Who happens to be your cousin and yeah. best friend? So yeah. it's, a, it's a difficult job trying to do what I do, not only gauge credibility, but go back up to 50 years. But I was going to say, it was like we, like we talked about making an impact on somebody's life. You, you, Oh, what I'm saying is, like we had somebody in court. We had a gentleman in court. Um, I won't say his name, but there were 400 people there for him. We do the cases I do have national attention. Like I was there's, say there's so no, the, yeah. we have the Innocence Project. This was the white men for racial justice, and there was and sports announcers there, celebrities all wearing t-shirts. But I'm not impacted by that. But some of the the causes that you see in the paper, they're the ones I actually do. The ones you read about that have been overturned. They're about seventy five percent mine. Yeah, well, I like that you're doing. You're the one that's uh, that's doing that because again, I ask you about pretty how much. You, the, how, I've been. I asked, I was asked to do six months. I'm on my fourth year. Um, it's pretty. Both. Um, I pray and I believe that all sides, from the defense side, the defendants, to the victims, the DA's office, and the judges, all have given me this great responsibility, which I have to take with so much care and responsibility and the only thing I can do is I try very hard to get them right yeah I was gonna say you didn't know that about me did you I knew a little I knew a, a little bit I did my research oh I, I did read I, I and then I saw there's there's one picture with you sitting with two gentlemen as you were trying to I think the article said that it's like you know Judge Scott to Claudio was uh trying to get them like talking about job stuff so that oh, they yeah, could I get- I do a lot of community service. I bring yeah. defendants who do minor violations from back in the day. We go to Manor and, and do meals for the sick and the elderly. I might bring 40 people every month and we prepare meals for the sick and the elderly. It's a four hour shift. <laughs> See, that's the thing. We're like I go to schools and talk to the whole ninth through 12th grades about, and I bring juvenile lifers with me to tell about their experience. They were in a car. They thought they were cool. They drove the car. Somebody shot the window. They did life. Yeah. Um, so I bring juvenile lifers to high schools around the region um, to try to give that impact. I'm trying to make the world a better place. I got a lot of haters, but that's because they're jealous of me. I'm very <laughs> handsome, very funny, have a beautiful wife, and um, good friends. That was one of the first things you said was that, you know, not everybody likes me, but they feel something, you know? They yep, 10 people will meet me Nine will have an opinion. No, no, I'm sorry. Ten people meet me. All ten will have an opinion. Nine will like me. One won't. Too brash, too arrogant, too out there, too outgoing. But if I get nine out of every ten people in this city to like me, damn, I'm ahead of the game. Yeah. And well, you're also yourself. I think people like people who are themselves. And that's that's what, uh, it's one of the, again, I think back to this whole mental, everything health problem is a lot. And again, when you asked about what's the point of the show, is like, I just want people to be themselves. We just want to offer a place where people could just be themselves and be comfortable being themselves and not not feel like they're judged. Um, well, I judge people. <laughs> you get paid for it, too. I do, rather well. Give me one quick second. Let's see. Uh, people have um, 
we have video like Big Brother. Uh, as I watch Shea Steaks, and see we have like six or seven people on there, so we're good. We can keep the podcast moving forward. Um, it's going well. What do you think? I think I think you're unbelievable. Um, um, me, you're you're the guy. I'm just sitting here as a guest. No, Max is the one who does it all. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but no, I uh, I appreciate it. I mean, I I don't know if there's, I guess one of my other. You know. well, what's going to happen where you're really going to appreciate it when Kevin Love comes and shakes your hand and thanks you for being, um, for doing this podcast, I'm trying gonna to help thank, people. I'm going to thank him. And um, yeah, it will be a mutual admiration. We'll do a group hug. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a group hug. Uh, so, all right. So I want to, I want to transition here and um, oh. talk about some Philly stuff because you said it's the best place on earth. I think oh. Philly's got a, a heck of a, uh, a reputation. Um, it's negative for no apparent reason. We threw um, snowballs at Santa um, 50 years ago, and they won't let us live us down. It's kind of crazy. Um, I watch sporting events, and my friends and I all like text when like people in Cleveland throw batteries, or you know, um, who was it? Um, Pat Mahomes got doused with beer. Like that's all good, but nobody gets it except Philadelphia. We like can jaywalk and like look at those Philadelphians. It's the city of brotherly love for a reason. We're a great city. Yeah, and I, there's a sign that uh, Philadelphia is not as bad as Philadelphians say. <laughs> um, I think it's the greatest city on earth. Um, we have so much. It's the biggest small city on earth. We have distinct neighborhoods. We have incredible food. We're, the city's laid out perfectly. If you've ever been to L.A., it takes an hour to get everywhere on the planet. Yeah. Like, you can't go to the Acme without driving an hour. New York is too um, jammed in. Um there's other great cities, but there's a tour room to go. We even have all four seasons. We get spring, summer, fall. What's the other one? Winter. Winter, yeah. It's the toughest we, one. We get a little bit. And as we heard from my wife, um, she doesn't count the four great. She has four different wardrobes and then gave me grief about it. But we have great climate. We have nice people. We have great restaurants. We have sports. We have history. We signed the Constitution here. Um we have the oldest post office, oldest zoo, oldest public library, and so much, so much history. We have Rocky. Yeah, we have Rocky. Yeah, so I've never inspirational. Seen, I've never seen Rocky, which is like an outrage. You've never uh, listen to me. I'm not talking to you again until you see <laughs> yeah. the movie Rocky. I, I've been it, uh, getting beat up about it a little bit. I got okay. Listen, to I've me. I've never been a movie guy. You don't have to be a movie guy. You have to be a a, a Rocky guy. Rocky's like ingrained in us yeah well that's the thing is on my morning walk when i go down and, and i see people taking pictures with the rocky statue and, and again it's all how you see things like i i um i've had a tough i don't know six months i've been i've been down in the dumps a little bit um and i've been looking at everything and everything's like a little bit darker okay. but again when i'm talking about this mind mindset shift now i'm starting to see things in a different way mm -hmm. it's like i the, the noise of the city used to bother me like we're right here you, you know you got the sirens and alarms and helicopters flying over all the time you like, hear helicopters all the time, yeah. I mean, especially when Biden comes through. Well, that's like once every six months. Yeah. He's also staying like eight feet from where we are sitting The right Sheraton, now. yeah. He's staying eight feet away. Of course you're going to hear people. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you have to sacrifice yeah. um, for the greater good. So Biden comes in and some people like him, some people don't. But he definitely gets out the vote in Philadelphia, which he needs to win Philadelphia to win the state. And he needs to win the state generally to win the election. What do you so think about all you that? You might have to put up with helicopters if you like Biden. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know enough to, to have an opinion, honestly, at this point. Um, I don't, well, how about I just like them both, Trump and Biden? I, I was going to say, vote for we, don't talk of politics. The above. we don't really talk politics too much, but what's your, uh, what's your take on the, the situation right now? I need a third candidate to step up who's moderate and not polarizing. And is, is that supposed to be RFK? No. Um, it needs to be somebody like Manchin or um, he's a Democrat who kind of votes Republican. You need, I don't understand why. But is it going to happen? Like a John McCain who would have been great. I don't see the, like a third horse emerging right now. I don't know. It's not going to, not for this election. I'm hoping by the time I die, there's a third party who's a reasonable, I mean, I think sadly it might have more to do with abortion rights now than anything. I think the religious right and the progressive left have entrenched their positions and they fight for the 30% in the middle. I don't. I think there's 30% of progressives, the younger class, who aren't Republicans because they haven't turned 40 yet. Um, 
the under 30 crowd is going to be Democrat. The over 55 crowd is going to be Republican. It's that middle 40% that really drive us. And um, I, you need a candidate that can get all 40%. Because if one of the Democrats or Republicans get just 10%, it becomes 40, 30, 30. And it's really hard for a moderate to get that whole 40%. That's why all these politicians cowtail either the progressives or the, um, the right, because you just need 10%. Trump gets his, I never thought Trump can win. I thought it was funny when he won, um, <laughs> because I said, who's going to vote for this clown? At that time, he did some good things, don't get me wrong. Who's going to vote for this guy who's like, you know, who's a TV show host? It turned out that he had a 30% or believed in everything he did, and no, everybody else had fives and tens. So he has his 30% base, and Biden has his 30%. And they have to keep their staunch supporters in place by doing things that us in the middle don't agree with. And I don't know... There's got to be an incredibly great candidate to get, to get that middle 40 and maybe grab 5% from each of the entrenched positions. Why, do, why is it happening though? Because I think the interesting part that I think the majority, like 80% of people would agree with is how are these our two candidates? <sighs> how is this the situation that we're at as a country? Well, Biden's the existing president and, and nobody can beat Trump because he has that 30 or 40% base. But and how is there like, and, and, I, again, I try not to, you know, shoot my opinion yeah, on this, this, this stuff. This is politics. This but is like, an analysis. Yeah. But like, how is there not a younger candidate? Like, I just think, again, like, what is it? Biden's 81 or something like that? And Trump's 77? Oh, 80, yeah. Um, That's insanity. Like, again, like, where's all the, where's the fucking adults in the room? I'm sorry, but like, where's, <sighs> where's somebody to say, like, this is clearly not right. How do we not have, like, there's something you know we have, wrong. We know, know who should be our next president. And maybe we'll, we'll start with this thousand or two thousand people. There's a, I don't remember which ones they are because I confused them all. There's a couple of talk show hosts um, that used to be very liberal, like Bill Maher, who have now kind of gotten more to the middle and say, like, Trump's not that crazy and Biden is kind of off center with some of these issues with immigration. And we need somebody who can call us both sides to their face. Like, this doesn't make sense. What's best for America, I understand... Um, that you don't believe in abortion, but that's good for you. You might not be able to tell a woman who got raped what their life should look like. We respect you and don't get it. And we should be able to talk to the progressive and say, if somebody doesn't believe in abortion, don't make them, you know, we can't use government funding to fund abortion. So that's kind of the way I see that. Like, I can see the staunch pro-life people not wanting the government to encourage or pay for it. But I can see that being a middle ground, but I don't, and that's a crazy issue and I'm not going to get too deep, but that's a bigger issue. But there's somebody going to say, I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying, but this is kind of the fair, just thing to do. Well, it might not exactly align. Let's maybe compromise on a couple of these issues um, to make it a little bit more um, palatable to you. Um, and we'll take out you know, all government funding, but let's maybe get private donations, you know, where you'll allow that or some, yeah. and that Soros or somebody give a couple billion dollars for that. Not Planned Parenthood where the government funds. I get that. I yeah. get the religion, right? Believe so strongly and they pay their taxes. Maybe they, that's a big enough issue where we, but there needs to be more adults in the fucking room, as you say, to say, hey guys, come on, step back. It, you're taking too strong a position. Um, and uh, this podcast, while it deals with some things, delves in lots of things. And we're going to pick up part two because I have to get out of here. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. I have some work to do. I would say, I, family. But my I'm, only I'm, comment I'll on come that, back in about um, 10 episodes and we'll see where yeah, we stand. My only comment on that was like, I can't, I, I'm surprised Tucker Carlson didn't jump jump in the ring. Is it Tucker? Somebody, is Tucker? Somebody, out of, I, I don't remember which one. It could be Tucker, it could be Bill. Um, but they're like more reasonable people who kind of now. See, but the Fox people are, it, it was so crazy to me. And I used to show examples where they were both, something would happen and both sides would say how wrong it was or how right it was. I'm like, you're saying the same thing in two different ways. And it's pretty funny how Biden, I'm, I'm, I have some strong opinions about immigration. 
not only agree with Mr. Krasner and some of this stuff, I believe if you're here illegally and you're working, you're doing a great job, maybe we should find a spot for you. But I believe if you're here illegally and you're selling heroin, we should send you back to wherever you came from, or if you're raping people, or if you're burglarizing houses. Just because you got to cross our border illegally doesn't mean you cannot be productive in our society. Yeah. And if you're not going to be productive, I'm probably okay with that. But if you're going to outright commit felony crimes, see you later. Yeah. Um, the sanctuary city stuff where we protect illegal immigrants from um, being deported, even when they commit serious felonies like rapes, burglaries, carrying guns, and selling heroin. I just don't understand that. Shouldn't that be easy? Like, you're here illegally, and you're committing serious crimes. I don't know you have a right to stay. Yeah. It's like, I mean, where's the common sense party? I think that's like, the... Isn't that, like, <laughs> isn't that and, obvious? And letting everybody in doesn't make sense, but anybody who's persecuted... So, like, one party doesn't want anybody in. One wants everybody in. And there's got to be a fair compromise. And I think, me and you can sit here in about 10 minutes and say, not every crime is deportable. Yeah, if you get a DUI, okay, we all drink. You, you know, you stole something from a car, you're not really a danger. But by the same token, if you rape somebody and you're illegally, why do I protect you from staying in this country? Why don't I send you back to El Salvador or Cambodia or Mexico or Canada or France? Like, why am I letting you stay here when you have no right, ab the absolute right to be in the United States is an absolute right, in my opinion. Uh, if you want to come here and be productive, great legally. And if you got here illegally, but you are productive, why not let you stay? But protecting outright felons doesn't seem like makes sense to me. Yeah. How about you? What, my opinion on that? Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't think people that are doing those levels of crime need to be here, especially if they're here illegally. Isn't that what the word is, illegal? Like, okay, we're good then. I'll so let you that. stay there so you don't have to. Uh, but, but, and that's a topic we probably shouldn't touch. Thank you for having me. No, no, no. Worries. I had such a great time. Shay Steaks. I had a great time too. Now, you watch me take this out of one of the bags and keep it on the grill. It was cut in the last hour, but that's the way it looks. Now I'm going to season it with what I like, which is red garlic jalapeno. A little bit of a kick, not much. And then we're going to do a little bit of secret, not tell you on the air ingredient. It just makes it so yummy. We've done about a minute and a half. This is fresh, never been frozen. Comes apart at the touch. Just at the touch. Just at the touch. Just pull it apart because it's been just the touch. Never been frozen is the key to great food. Great quality is the key to great food. A chef who knows when the food's done is the key to great quality. You can't overcook it because it's the marbling that's in the front end that gives it all the flavor. So it doesn't sit on the grill for 40 minutes, cooking out all the flavor for the sake of convenience. I don't need to get you in and out. I need to give you great food, and I'll still get you in and out because it's never been frozen, and we still care about our people. So I just put some onions and peppers. This is what we do for two steaks. I pull it apart. This is one man over there who's like onions peppers, so I'll just give him a little bit of onions. It's almost done. As soon as it goes from brown, from pink to brown, that very light brown at that, is when we start putting our cheese on it. Turn it over. Keep moving, you got enough room, Alex? No, I don't need All right, well, hopefully you'll find one. Start separating it around. I'll give you mine momentarily. I'm going to put my cheese. And we will combing our spots. Here you go, it's going to draw sticks. Also cut pretty much on the hour. What we use is no pink left, and you could use basically the food medium rare. So about eight and a half to nine ounces of beautiful fine rice. Two 
Cersei is super sharp. First Cersei on draws. Come on. The Cersei does not want to cooperate. And this is yours, Mr. Photographer. Beautiful fresh Lucio's roll. Look at that roll. Little crunch on the outside. Seeds, so soft on the inside. Get the steak, fill it up, get the rest of the steak, put it in the hole that I had to create when I uh, had to take it out because it's a full steak and then like another 33% of a steak. See the steam coming up? It's going to stay steaming until it's finished.